What's going on? This is the Saturday Down South podcast presented to you by Texas Beat. I am Connor O'Gara. Will, the sky is falling in Tuscaloosa, in case you hmm. haven't heard. Uh, not really, but depending on which Georgia, LSU, Tennessee, or Auburn fan that you talk to with totally unbiased opinions, they will definitely let you know that Bama is going to be a bottom feeder SEC program after the transfer portal window claimed both Caleb Downs and Caden Proctor. Uh, TBD on where those guys end up. We will eventually get to that. We're going to have a little bit of Caleb Downs discussion, by the way, with Aaron Murray. He will talk about the return of Carson Beck. You're one of Bobo, a little bit of Saban, more stuff with him. We have our jersey contest. I am repping an Ernie Banks Cubs jersey. Yeah, Mm-mm. right there. All right, man. See, this is this is the thing about you. I was joking about the Midwestern politeness because you're like, you just won the competition. Ernie Banks throwback. I knew you had some gas. I knew you had some fire back there. I will save the story uh, for later, which I might have told at one point or another, like way back in the day uh, on these airways, but uh, we'll save that for for later. And then just kind of a mini housekeeping announcement. I know we've had a lot of those lately, but just want to keep everyone up to date kind of on the thought process, what exactly we're thinking, what to expect from us uh, this offseason. But first, Will, fun exercise, fun exercise today. And we're going to get to the Bama part of this at, at some point, maybe we'll see. Um, but we've we've talked about a lot of different things with the 12 team playoff and adjusting expectations. So I thought it'd be fun today to do the eight sec teams who deserve playoff expectations. Does that seem a little bit hopium ish kind of, that's the point it's talking yeah. season. It's silly season. I love, that's why I love the off season in uh, August and September. Cause it's like, everybody's got a shot. It's, you know what? in in the 12 team playoff era, that has never been more true. Mm -hmm. everyone's got a shot or at least some teams do. It is weird to say out loud, eight SEC teams deserve playoff expectations in the 12 team playoff. But even if you haven't changed your own expectations, you're still thinking about stuff that happened this past season. You're still looking at this area on your roster and saying, we got to hit this in the portal. We got to be able to do this or that, whatever. We all need to mentally reset for this new era of college football. So like now is a great chance to be able to do that in the beginning of 2024 as college football fans. I think we actually adjust better than what we're given credit for. There's kind of this stuck in the mud, set in your ways. This program is, you know, destined to succeed because they won national championships in the 1930s. And like, I think there's a lot of that that goes around. I actually think we adjusted to the 14 playoff really well. And I think even though there are going to be moments that frustrate us with the 12 team playoff, I think there will be a lot of adjustment that we as consumers do because guess what? That's our only choice. And and we will. That's what we always do. Yep. When I say that eight SEC teams deserve playoff expectations, I am saying this knowing full well that the SEC will not have eight teams in the playoff. Okay. I know that very, very well aware. Not going to do that thing. Um, that would be a wild bracket to just throw out there and just see, just see how long it, ca- it takes Canel to circle back around to it and find it. Who, who does follow me on Twitter, by the way? So we could definitely find that um, and, and just have at it. Would just love to see the response with no context whatsoever um, and just fire that off. Not going to do that. Not putting that into the universe. It is nearly impossible. Even if the five seven model is approved as expected, they're kind of changing what they're going to do. Not that the Pac twelve no longer exists. The Mm -hmm. expectation is that we'll have the champs of the SEC, the Big Ten, the ACC, the Big Twelve, as well as the top ranked Group of Five conference champ. Those teams will get auto bids. So technically, in that world, we will have seven at large spots. Add that with the SEC champ, there can be eight teams in the playoff. It won't happen. It won't happen. It's just impossible. Well, listen, if we're adopting the five and seven model, then Florida's one. Are they? They <laughs> did go five, five and seven. seven. <laughs> yeah, they did go five and seven. Gosh, it's when you don't make a bowl game, I have to do that very brief thing where I'm like, gosh, what was your record again? Um, right. Because yeah. game's missing. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, really so you, point. you hit on something really critical, though, and I think this is a great reset, which is like playoff expectations. I personally, me, I'm like, you know, looking at LSU, okay. I predict this to be a down year for LSU just because just lost the second best quarterback in, you know, LSU history, you know, playoff expectations. So how does that translate to, like, I know you talked about the amount of teams, but in a given year, 
how, like, what is that usual bar? If you can kind of look back the last couple of years, because this year we did have a little bit deeper of a field. Some years it might be more teams. Sometimes it might be less teams. Playoff expectations. What exactly is that? I think if you're looking at just from a playoff expectations, who has New Year's Six Bowl hopes? It okay. is different now with 16 teams in the conference as opposed to just having the 14. This year, the SEC's had four teams in New Year's Six Bowls and five if you want to retroactively count Texas as like part of that group, even though they didn't play in the SEC. But I believe that the SEC usually will put three to four teams in the 12-team playoff. And okay. maybe like the outlier years will be two or five, kind of on those ends of the spectrum. There, there will not be a year in which the SEC only has one team in the playoff. I'm praying. I'll, I'll go on record. I'll say that now. I just... Even if you look back at, gosh, 2015, 2016, where that East champ was just a downtrodden Florida team. I shouldn't say downtrodden Florida team, but it was a Florida team that we knew was not on that level. There still would have been somebody from the West that would have been better for that spot. Like I think LSU in 2015 would have been would have been part of that discussion as well. Mm-hmm. Um so, like, there will not be a year in which it's just one SEC team. So I feel good saying that even in the, the leanest of years, the SEC will have at least two. And I think there will be years where they will have five. I don't know that six is quite realistic because of how much, you know, cannibalism there will be within the SEC. But does, does that kind of make sense? Is that, that's not really talking about expectations, more so what, what I think the year end, the year end result will look like. No, yeah, and that's that's you know that's the whole thing is that I'm tr- trying to think you know so is it compare and contrast to New Year's Six? I mean, is that if you said your team yeah. wanted to go New Year's Six, it's about the same? Is it harder or easier? Um, it's this. It should be the same, okay. right? It's it's different because, I mean, well, no, it's I guess it's not different in a sense. Like, I'm trying to factor in the Pac-12 part of this, yeah. right? And try and like, I I think it'll be a little bit different from that standpoint. Because if if you have more of those auto bids that are that are up for grabs, and you don't have a conference that that is fully locked in in the same sort of way, it will be different in that way, but then different in others because of how many teams are are competing for that auto bid within the SEC, how many teams are competing within the Big Ten for that auto bid. So I, it, it's kind of it's a little bit too tricky of a question to answer, but I feel like in a given year there were probably six, seven teams that feel like, hey, we have New Year's Six Bowl upside. I talk about that a lot in the preseason. And this year, getting to 16, though, I do feel like there are eight teams, which I will get to in a second here, that have that. Yeah, I think that's, you know, for now, I think the best exactly what you just said is right about New Year's Six. And it it goes into the pack two in the auto bids and how they really truly do end up breaking that up in the end. Because that's the funny part of it is that an entire conference has just imploded one has grown larger. Well, three have grown larger, right? Also, the Mountain West, I guess, has also grown well, larger. Big Twelve, Big Twelve has grown has grown larger yeah. in theory. Yes, yeah, that was the main one I was thinking of because they absorbed all those teams. But then I was like, well, actually, the the SEC technically got larger, but then uh, the Big Ten officially expanded because the SEC is having those contracts be uh, be like acted upon. But the Big Ten fully added teams, so did the Big 12. So point being, you know, they might go in and say, okay, well, this whole Pac-12 situation doesn't really make a ton of sense. But as far as what we know now, you know, it does feel about like New Year's Six. And every year there is a team, right? And, you know, whatever LSU was probably that team this year where you're like, you know, this feels about like a New Year's Six team, but it's not really in a New Year's Six bowl. That style of team could still as well be left out of the playoff. Correct. Yes, Mm -hmm. very much, very much could. And – Today's exercise is not predicting the eight SEC teams that will make the playoff. That right. is that is not what Fair. I'm saying. It is saying that these eight SEC teams deserve to set their preseason expectations at making the 12-team playoff. In other words, if any of these teams miss the 12-team playoff, they're entitled to varying levels of disappointment. Yep. That fire is, your coaches, Paul. If you miss, if you're one of these teams and you miss the playoff, fire some coaches. There will be. There will mm-hmm. be because that is the way that this sport works. So yep. it's not to say that it's playoff or bust for every team that I list because bust implies that the season was a failure. Like if Oklahoma goes nine and three and Jackson Arnold looks like the real deal, but the Sooners are barely on the outside looking in, it's kind of similar to what they experienced this year. I'm not going to sit here and say that the season was a total failure like I did with Florida when they lost five in a row to miss out on a bowl game. 
varying levels. Can't can't be so black and white. But yes, disappointment is fair for these teams, these eight teams, if they make the 12 team field. Does that all make sense? Yes. And and I will say one thing. I mean, playoff appearance will make and break so many resumes. Exactly like what you just said. Like if there's a weird situation where a team like that gets, gets shot, like one of the Florida teams you talked about under Mullen gets shot into a playoff. It's like, we're coming off a playoff berth. You know, we were right there. We were competing for a championship versus let's say you had, you know, LSU season from the last two seasons, really, where you were a non-New Year's Six team, but you were still a good team. It's like, well, Brian Kelly hadn't even made the, the playoffs yet. I mean, what's he doing? So I think that's actually a pretty interesting part of it. That just these slight little tweaks could make your season a success or a failure, not even based on team quality, but competition, also competition with the SEC. We saw a little bit of a weird year. Well, maybe not going forward last year, which was, you know, we had Mizzou jump up. We had Ole Miss jump up. We had, you know, random more or less teams really in the thick of it, which will push, you know, an LSU down. Didn't push Georgia down to the SEC championship. But those teams at the top, you know, in Alabama going, you know, having three losses or being an OK team wouldn't have been automatic in a year like last year. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. They're, the varying levels of spin zone will be fun to watch. Very, yeah. very fun to watch. And probably not a whole lot a variance in the way that some will make it seem like there actually is. Okay, so let's let's start with this list. And in, this is in no particular order, but let's start with Georgia. Let's start with Georgia. In each of the last seven years, Georgia would have made the 12-team playoff. In each of the last seven years, whoever Georgia would have faced would have been like, crap, Georgia made the 12-team playoff. Kirby's got four losses in the 2020s decade. Three of them are to the guy that retired last week. One of them is to a guy that's in media now that's been on this very podcast. Shout out to Dan Mullen. The last active head coach, I know Marler tweeted this out as well. The last active head coach to beat Kirby Smart was Tom Herman, Sugar Bowl, end of the 2018 season. Yep. Pretty crazy. Who could forget? Pretty crazy. Not a single person who has handed Kirby Smart one of his 16 losses as a head coach is at their current job. The only ones that are still at Power 5 programs right now, Hugh Freeze, who beat Kirby when he was at Ole Miss back in 2016, and Gus, who beat Kirby, obviously, when he was at Auburn in 2017. Dogs are shaping up to have historically dominant defense, especially if they get Caleb Downs out of the portal like everyone's been talking about. The entire front seven from the Orange Bowl is back. I am really optimistic about some of those young pieces. And obviously, the return of Carson Beck, very, very big. Trevor Etienne, we've talked about these things. We don't need to waste any more time on this. Georgia deserves to have 12 team playoff expectations. Any pushback at all? Um, Not at all. And yeah, I would say, yeah, that's that. It would be a massive disappointment. I I will follow when you do the positive, I'll do the what if, you know, that would be a massive disappointment if they do not make a 12 team playoff. Especially in the first year of the post saving world. That would be like, what? what's going on? Like, what? This is not supposed to work. What what, what are you doing? and Drake are just kings of the (laughs) SEC randomly. Left is right, right is left. Yeah, no. Uh, Okay, next team, Texas. I'm going to admit that I might have been slightly too bullish on Texas in my preseason rankings to have them all the way at two. Like, if I was doing, again, I want to redo on that just because so much changed right after those came out. I was like, crap, I wish I waited just another week to be able to do that. Might even have Ohio State up there too with all the guys that that they have coming back, which is just kind of crazy. but I still do love the fact that Quinn Ewers is coming back. Year three with Sark. Four returning starters in the offensive line. They lose Murphy and Sweat on defense, but they are loaded with experience behind him. When you beat conference opponents by an average of three scores and your two losses go down to the wire, neutral site games against teams who won double-digit games, you know that you're not a fluke. Okay, This yep. was not some random one-off type of year for Texas. This was a sign that they very much look like they are one of the premier programs in the country, which, look, I have been the guy that has always pushed back on that. Well, you know, I love a good Maryland joke when it comes to Texas. Oh, yes. Like, oh, God, there are no shortage of horns down moments that I have just sat here without a dog in the fight and cackled. Just including, cackled. honestly, the best one might have been last night. That was incredible. Look, um, we're going to get into how much hoops we talk on this air, on this show. But yes, I will be one to say, if you throw horns down at me, I I will not call it classless. I'll just say that. Okay. I'll just say yeah. that. Um, but yeah, I mean, by the way, that's not even mentioning the fact that Texas went into Bama and, and won that game by double digits. Of course, you lose Bo Davis on the defensive staff. Other than that, a lot of continuity within that coaching staff. I always like that. 
And as we talk about playoff expectations, it is appropriate to actually talk about the schedule. It is not appropriate to talk about the schedule when we are ranking teams. But when we are talking about playoff expectations, schedule is very, very important. Texas has to go to Michigan in week two, right? A Michigan sure team that going to look very different. I, I think no matter what happens with this whole Harbaugh deal, if your team hasn't tweeted out that they've interviewed Harbaugh, I guess you're in the minority at this point. Maybe my team hasn't tweeted that out yet. Maybe I have my phone set. For I wish alerts. our teams would interview Harbaugh, don't you? I would I would give an uncomfortable amount of money just for an interview tweet. That's all I want. Just just show me that you care about this and you recognize anyway, I'm gonna get mad. Don't worry, Maybe. Connor. They hired they stuck with Dennis Allen and Kevin Ward instead, all right. <laughs> Matty Refluce, Kevin Warren, different, different reasons why they frustrate me. But yes, I get yeah. that point. Um but yeah, Michigan's gonna look really, really different. The, the time of year is not going to really hurt Texas in that matchup. So it's it's more winnable than it could have been. And after that, though, Texas's mm-hmm. only true road game until mid-November is at Vandy. So, yeah, only three SEC road games, and it's against teams who were a combined 13 and 24 last year. That's wow. nice to the new kid. That's really nice to the new kid. Texas can go one and two against Michigan, Oklahoma, and Georgia – and still have a very favorable path as a 10-2 and two S- team, like regardless of what happens, SEC championship, if they get a berth or not, that, that path to a playoff as a 10-2 and two squad would very much be there. Man, that is actually going to be a record breaker for who do I root for in this Texas-Michigan game. I Because Texas is still like up and coming. It's not like a Bama where I'm like, okay, you guys are inevitable. If you want to go to Bama, you're going to go to Bama. Texas is like actually right there fighting with UGA, LSU, yeah, I guess OU's are still there. I don't really think they ever left as far as being a top tier program. But yeah, I mean, okay. Now when we talk about expectations, you know, talked about a team that won a big game, you know, made the playoff. They can. I know what you're going to ask. I know what you're going to ask. Get to it. <laughs> Get to it. <laughs> if they have expectations of a playoff and they would be disappointed if not, does that mean that they're officially back? If they get to a playoff this year, consecutive playoff berths, mm-hmm. Texas is back. Okay. That's yeah. it. Then it will, and it also it ties to what I was going to say, which is that, yeah, I think they expect it. I think it would be disappointing if after you make a 14 playoff, if you don't make a 12 team playoff, yeah, you can talk about the SEC. And that's a huge part of it because at the end of the day, you know, there's no, I can't even say Kansas because Kansas is a tough out now. There's no, you know, UCF, I hate to say it, in this conference that is like, oh, you can go down there. I mean, their first Big 12 win came in like, November, you know, not breaking any news, but yeah. point being like there it's, it's harder to coast, especially with this. So, so maybe depending on how the losses fall, it's like, oh, you know, maybe we just, this team just snuck up on us. But I think with that as favorable, the schedules you're going to see in the sec, that's the other part of it. It's almost like a transitional schedule. Yeah. I think the boys in Austin would be pretty disappointed if they didn't make a playoff this year. Speaking of favorable schedules to get to the 12 team playoff, Ole Miss, if not now, when that's, that's the biggest thing. It's the biggest thing. If not now, with Nick Saban out of the conference, out of the sport, the playoff field tripling, when will it ever be more appropriate to talk about Ole Miss having playoff expectations? Outside of the Judkins transfer, this couldn't be lined up much better. It really is setting up well for Ole Miss. I've talked about how much I love the portal additions on defense. We don't need to go down that road. For my money, Ole Miss, the best trio of pass catchers in the SEC with Trey Harris, with Juice Wells, with Caden Prescorn, who, by the way, Caden Prescorn, he's going to be 25 years old next fall. Think about that. He's not like that cat on Miami. He's coming back for year nine. So he's not the oldest tight end even in power five, but old. <laughs> the second oldest tight end about, yeah, good point. So you you know all that. But Ole Miss, that schedule, mm, that's a big part of this for me. Originally, I pointed to the no Bama thing as being huge for Lane, not as much of an automatic loss. Obviously, it's a little bit different now. Still, Ole Miss only faces three Power 5 teams who lost fewer than six games. At LSU, a team that it beat. Going into Death Valley is different. We know that. Oklahoma at home. Georgia at home. Like I said with Texas, Ole Miss can go 1-2 and two in those games and still have a pretty good shot to be 10-2. and two. And by the way, that's what they were last year. And I'm banking on this team being better with more experience and a more favorable schedule. So playoff expectations for Ole Miss are very fair. So this is a very fascinating one 
right? Because like, so much is happening that's putting me in a position of like, okay, well, you know, how, what can I think about Ole Miss? And part of it is that hard ceiling that we talked about with, oh, Kiffin can't beat Saban. Now, again, Kirby, pretty much 90% of Saban, 95, like we talked about. Um, but here's where it really becomes interesting. So if you're Lane Kiffin, you know, you've had, I guess, it was three productive seasons. I mean, that one season where he was like trying to get the Auburn job, I think we can honestly just, as much as I hate to be this guy, kind of just not count the back half of that season. Because if you take that part of that season and you take almost the rest of his time at Ole Miss, it sticks out to me. Because I don't know if he wasn't focused. I don't know if the players weren't focused, but they were losing games. I mean, they blew like this insane lead to LSU when they were just, at that point, a better team. But then they had that nosedive. They had the weird Mississippi State game. Like, it just felt like if you take that part out of it, and that being said, now you're building on what year four of solid, non embarrassing football. This is going to be year five for Lane. Right. The only two coaches that have been in the SEC longer than him are Kirby and Stoops. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed that you just went to bat for Lane in a very like PR spin the stat sort of way. I don't yeah. think I've ever seen you do that. That is a that is a first where you're like, just take away that part of the year where it looked like he was interested. In you. I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, when they played LSU, they're ranked number seven, right? And then the whole season, but we know why. That's the deal. This team is not playing like themselves. Why? Compare it with the rest of the data. Well, obviously, Lane Kiffin was seriously considering leaving Ole Miss. It's, I think at this point, we could say the amount of hoops they had to jump through to keep him there. I mean, their AP high last year was higher than this year. That's the thing. So at a point in the season, they were looking like one of those teams and they fell through. So if you look at those last years and you just, he's not going to leave, right? So you take that variable out. I think that, uh, I think they'd be disappointed if they didn't make the playoff this year, especially with the portal class. Absolutely. You have to be disappointed. Knowing the investment that's being made to that portal class, this is a, a playoff or bust type season. Bust isn't Lane gets fired, but bust is, man, Lane is still kind of in that next tier of head coach. You can't call him one of mm -hmm. the premier coaches in the sport if that continues to be this thing that hangs over you. And Ole Miss will feel very much like it's on the outside looking in. And let's remember, too, if you get an injury to Jackson Dart, you're still in a spot where you can put Walker Howard in there. Yeah. And just like that, you're thinking to yourself, okay, yeah, I know it's tough for the, for some of these guys. Like he's going to be in year three. He's going to be yeah. in year three. So this isn't necessarily a situation where it's like, ah, you got to put a true freshman in there, you know, a five-star true freshman. Very, very different in that regard. So I, I think their floor, I was just talking about this on off campus with, with Hester and Budden when like, what's their floor. I think the Ole Miss floor is like eight and four. Like they, they should, there's no world. They should be worse than eight and four with that schedule, with that roster, with how ready for SEC competition it should be. That's and and their their upside in my opinion is is they have final four upside. Do I think that they're gonna get to a national championship? No, I don't. I don't think that they have that type of upside, but can they get to to a, a semifinal type game if everything goes right? Yes, I do. So I'm gonna just this is a little bit of a thought exercise here. I'm realizing okay the logo might be stopping me. So what if we try this? You know when I think Ole Miss, I think team that has never made it to Atlanta. I think team that can't consistently win. I think about, you know, you talk about the mascot. I'm not going to go down that thing. I look at this team. I, I almost want to call them new miss because they have lane. They're having fun. It looks fun to play for Ole Miss out. And we, you know, you could talk about the scandals with Hugh freeze. That was not consistent. This to me feels like a whole new football team. This doesn't 1960 looks like it doesn't matter to this team. The amount of innovation they're doing in Mississippi, right? Talking about the portal talking about Lane's offense, talking about how funny and cool he is on Twitter. This is not Ole Miss. This is something new. So I can't think of all this other stuff. And also Saban's gone. You know, that was a team that couldn't beat Alabama. Not as much of a problem anymore because some of those teams without Nick Saban, I think Lane could probably get up on them and win versus these collapses at the end versus Saban having his number. So I think this is a totally new football team. I think that now that Lane's invested, now that he's locked in, you're right. I would never do PR for a team that I can't even say what we called them growing up. But I think this is a new era for them. And I think that those expectations, now they're playing as the hunted. And we'll see how they do this year, but I'm starting to buy in. If you are trying to get a little bit more hopium, if you're an Ole Miss fan, you're looking at the Bama thing. I realize they don't play Bama this year. They don't play Bama mm -hmm. unless they get mm – -hmm a matchup in the SEC championship, a matchup in the 12 team playoff or anything like that. They are not on the regular season schedule. But if you're looking for a little bit of that hopium, Harbaugh, Urban. Harbaugh couldn't beat Urban. Yep. Urban leaves. 
Ryan Day gets him year one. Like, oh man, it's more of the same. We know what's happened after that. That difference at head coach, I think it matters. I, I really, really do. And and TBD on whether or not that means all of a sudden Ole Miss. I'm not saying Ole Miss is going to rattle off three in a row against Bama. I've done more defending of Bama, um, but it's it is something that is that is significant. And I don't think it's just simply the logo that is getting in the way for Lane. Yeah, oh, you talk about new new Miss, new Zoo. That is Mizzou. Okay. okay. Seamless transition, Will. Seamless transition. I'm going to get some blowback on this one. There's a couple on this that I'm gonna, I know I'm going to get blowback. But remember a few things. Mizzou would have made a 12-team playoff this year for – look, it's kind of like – it is kind of like Ole Miss, right? Very similar in that you have a mobile, multi-year starting quarterback coming back. You have an electric, bona fide wide receiver one – when healthy and along with some nice complimentary options, you lost your superstar running back just like Ole Miss did, but you made some pretty significant portal pickups to be able to, to kind of deal with that and make sure that this isn't some massive drop off. The questions will be on defense where obviously like replacing Blake Baker, that's going to be a challenge. They still haven't, as of this recording, filled that vacancy for the DC spot. You had six players on that Mizzou defense leave for the NFL with eligibility remaining. That doesn't include Darius Robinson, who was a first-team All-SEC guy on that defensive line who left early, um, or that was actually his final year of eligibility. They added a lot of, of Power 5 transfers so far. They, they added five from Power 5 on the defensive side alone. That's good. If they make the right coordinator hire, I'm optimistic that the Mizzou defense won't be a total liability, plus the schedule. And here's, here's really where, to me, if you're kind of on the fence about this, the schedule puts it over the top. Just like Ole Miss sets up really, really well. Mizzou's first game against a Power 5 team who lost less than six games in 2023 will be October 26th at Bama. Then a bye week, and then home against Oklahoma, and the schedule closes against three teams who missed out on a bowl game. Mizzou's got four SEC road games. Three are against first-year head coaches, and one is against Shane Beamer, who Eli Drinkwitz owns. So that's really favorable. As long as Mizzou can avoid the all-important money-sleeper road game at UMass, the well-documented game at UMass, this is the type of schedule that you never think you're going to get in this new version of the SEC. So Mizzou, because of that, and because of what this offense can be, and they should be one of the best in the SEC, Mizzou deserves to have playoff expectations. So this one, I actually would disagree with if they would be disappointed. And I think that, and here's why, okay? With Lane, we talked about the track record. Talk about having, you know, what, two and a half of three years being going one direction, you know, figuring all that out. This was a pleasant surprise for Mizzou this season, okay? Now the question becomes, can you build off that, all right? Now, one thing that's different, okay, I am not a Pete Golding guy. I never have been. I'm not going to pretend that I was. And this is a guy who's from Louisiana who has heavy Louisiana ties. So it's not that I'm a hater. I just have never thought the guy was great. That being said, they were able to hire a guy like that. Mizzou, you know, got their defensive coordinator poached and then kind of the rhetoric was, well, he wasn't actually in charge of the DNs or the recruiting. That was Peoples. Well, then Peoples got poached too. And so where I'm sitting here is that this feels like a little bit of a down year because they're going to have to reload that defense. You talked about losing all those guys, losing all that continuity. I think their offense will be, you know, maybe as good, but their defense not having Blake Baker, not having those guys, having all these portal guys who don't even know who their coach is, right? I think that level of instability um, can create things. And also, I listen, if you're a Mizzou fan, you know this better than me. There is always just that little bit of element with Mizzou, like almost losing the Florida game, or it's like, you guys, come on, you're so close. And last year, you know, they won that game. They hung tight with LSU. They beat Kansas State. You know, you could go through and talk about that amazing bowl win against Ohio State, which I thought was so, so great. But the news cycle since then has kind of proven this might be a year to step back and then build for the future because while losing all those guys, while losing Schrader, right, while losing the defensive guys, it doesn't feel like they're about to get over a hump. It feels like they just reset expectations, and now they got to reload to break through that ceiling again. I don't think that Mizzou – is as good at the quarterback position as these teams were. But my question is, can Mizzou follow a path 
that is like what we saw with 2021 Ole Miss, a team that, look, Matt Corral pre-injury that year, you can't tell Man. me that wasn't one of the best four players in college football. He was incredible. Absolutely yep. awesome to watch. A team that I kept saying throughout that entire offseason, like, can this defense just flirt with mediocrity? Just flirt with mediocrity because, yeah, you're going to have to score a lot of points, but if you can just get to that place – where you're a middle of the road defense and you're like, we got a top 10, top 15 type offense. There is a path to 10 wins. There is. I do think that all those questions about the defense are worth asking. Right. And it does make me very, very nervous. I was, and I, I don't know what my post spring ranking of Mizzou is going to be nationally. If I'm going to have them in the top 10 or not, not going to have Arizona in that top 10 anymore. Might have to get back to my Utah love. My, I don't want to call Utah my side piece, but they kind of are. Um, I love me some Cam Rising. We know this. But they're going to be a tricky team to have to rank because their floor for defense is Basura. It is. Yeah. We mocked that 2021 Mizzou defense with Steve Wilkes every week. Oh, well, man. It was so bad. And that's yeah. why we gave that staff that came in with Blake Baker so much credit because mm -hmm. you're like, wait a minute. They have, they have this guy on the – they're, they're making this play that they're not just getting trucked in the run game constantly. Oh, they actually have these NFL guys at corner that can go up and make a play. They, they are going to have a massive question mark, but if they get that higher, right. And, and you can just get that guy that flirts with mediocrity. That's what this team will need to be able to navigate the schedule to get to that place where it can be a nine, 10 win team and have that shot at the, at the 12 team playoff. That's kind of my point with this, but I agree with you. The downside is there if they do not answer those questions on defense. Yep. Can we go to LSU? Sure. Let's do it. <laughs> no active coach in college football has a longer current streak of 10-win seasons than Brian Kelly. He winning as coach in college football. What voice was that? Oh, uh, that was my bad announcer voice. That's why I didn't ever think <laughs> I'd be on air. I thought you were going for a little bit of Keith Jackson, but the way you finished was not Keith Jackson. I don't want to say he's rolling over in his grave. He's exclaiming loudly in his grave, I think. If, if, but that wasn't a Keith Jackson petition, so you're good. Never mind. Mm -hmm. 10 is going to be such an important number for the 12-team playoff. Get to 10 wins. Let the rest take care of itself. Don't worry as much about, hey, we need to get into the conference championship. Get to 10 wins. Get to 10 wins. We know the offense for LSU is going to regress. I'm going to make a bold prediction. It will be worse. It's just a question of how much worse it will be. Will it be shades of Tennessee in 2022 where it had the number one offense in college football and then we saw what happened last year where it was the most boring offense of the Josh Heupel era? Will it be that kind of fall? Or instead, will this be like, oh, no, LSU actually still ends up having a top 20 offense. This is a group that can go win you a game in a given day and they can put up points against anybody. Those things are all very much in play. It was number one in the nation with a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback and two of the 10 best receivers in the sport, all of whom are gone, as is LSU's top running back in Logan Diggs, who we know is off to miss. But you've got a lot to like returning on that offensive line behind Garrett Nussmeyer, who won't get Mike Denbrock. It looks like we're going to have some shuffled pieces internally with the OC, with the play calling. But I think we will probably still feel like LSU has some continuity on the offensive side around Nussmeyer, and that is a positive. Nussmeyer would love, in an ideal world, I think his ceiling is becoming the 2024 version of Carson Beck. That's the hope. The guy who sat for three years, sat Wait, behind a legend. Like last year, like 2023? Yes. So he... Yes, the 20s. Okay. Yeah, my bad. I messed that up. A future person. Hold on. <laughs> yes. No, it will be really tough to project where both of those guys are going to be next. Yeah, you go. What I'm yeah. saying. If he is in that spot where we're talking about him and we're like, whoa, this guy does not look like a first year starter. He looks like somebody mm -hmm. who soaked up everything he possibly could. The game is slowed down for him. That would be great. That is his upside. His floor. And I thought about this for a while. Probably too long, and it probably won't make a whole lot of sense once the season starts. I'm not saying he's the exact same player. I'm not saying that. But his floor is like 2018 Jake Bentley, right? Okay. G guy that tries to do too much, isn't mobile enough to elevate his floor like a Matt Corral did. And he can have games where you're reminded that he's been around for a bit, but ultimately he doesn't get you to where you want to go. That's his floor. 
Okay. I think that is fair to a guy that is really intriguing and somebody that we're going to be talking about a lot. But I am. Listen, at least she didn't say Peyton Thorne. I'll take 2018 Jake Bentley. That's fine. Buddy, I'm even reluctant to say Peyton Thorne's floor is as low as Peyton Thorne. Right. I don't even, that feels like a slap in the face to Peyton Thorne. Yeah. Being honest. Can't go there. But where I am high and where I'm a lot more optimistic is the defensive improvement, of course. I did yeah. a pretty in-depth breakdown of this on SDS that you can check out by the time people are listening to this. Essentially, how does bringing back all of these guys, Blake Baker, Bo Davis, Corey Raymond, all of guys who are at LSU at one point or another, either as assistants, players, whatever. I, how does that impact LSU ceiling this year? I think it impacts it because I believe that LSU can beat you in more ways than this 2023 team could, where it doesn't just have to be 38 to 35. If I'm not mistaken, a single stop would be a new way, you know? They got one against Wisconsin. I think they got the one. Mason Smith, best play of the year. Happened on that last play. Yeah. Well, he was part of the play, but it wasn't like, you know, just yeah. full on vintage Mason Smith like we thought we were going to get. We made all three of our four defensive plays back to back to back, and that's called <laughs> trending upward. I get it. <laughs> Went on on a high note. Can't argue against that. I think LSU is going to face new starting quarterbacks in six of those first seven games, hmm. which is way different. And with a secondary that surprisingly returns a lot with a coaching staff that's going to be better equipped to coach it up. I, I was like figuring out like, all right, who, who do I like? returning a corner in this spot, who's who's going to be back at, at safety? Because there were so many things that just made you think like, gosh, this unit's not particularly good. Um, but th- if you look at the, the snap counts and all those different things, of the guys who actually played decent football, LSU should be in better shape on the back end, which they couldn't be much worse than they were this past year. But the good news is that my reservations with LSU coming into this past season was looking at that September schedule and seeing that LSU with a t- Totally unproven, unproven secondary started with Jordan Travis, Will Rogers, KJ Jefferson, Jackson Dart, all veterans that could pick you apart kind of in different ways. And outside of Rogers, that's what they all did. Those, yep. Yeah. Nailed that. <laughs> yeah. So, but LSU has that working. Plus three of those four SEC road games are against teams who missed out on a bowl with the lone bowl road game coming against AM year one with Mike Elko, a 10 win regular season should absolutely be the expectation for LSU. I sure hope so. Um, I I think a couple (laughs) of things about this team, right? So number one, then, and remember I said a couple podcasts ago, you know, LSU is the most interesting team in the SEC. And that's why I'm so interested in them because they're replacing uh, the best offense and the worst defense in the conference. Well, now Alabama is the most interesting team for sure. Right. So I, I try to not get in the LSU wormhole, but I think some of this stuff does matter. And part of that is, okay, on offense, could not be more thrilled. Okay, coming back with, I mean, looking at the last two Coach O offensive lines, okay, I'd never seen bad offensive line play, really. Those are both horrible, right? The way that Brian Kelly has rebuilt this offensive line with four or five starters returning, right? The two tackles have been two-year starters already. And they can't even leave yet because they have been, I mean, this team had just as much of a case for the Joe Moore award last year as Washington did simply because the offense could beat you in so many ways. There was not, I mean, as great as Logan Diggs was, right. He played about half the season. We had Josh Williams out there looking like Ron Dane. I said that Logan Diggs was the X factor in the offense. um, And then he got hurt and promptly the rushing offense got better because Jaden Daniels started running the ball. And so and, you know, I just thought he couldn't stay healthy like that. And again, I was wrong for doubting, doubting Jaden Daniels. But where I look at that is what makes me so interested by this team is this road grading offensive line. So you're not going to see what we got some of with Florida last year, where when your quarterback's under pressure, he starts making mistakes. He might just be making mistakes on his own. That's the thing. It's not going to be a bunch of, like, oh, no, it's like, why did you not hold on to that ball? It's going to be some, maybe he misses a read. Now, that being said, they just keep adding fast guys. They keep adding fast guys on the outside and huge behemoth tight ends on the inside. So what I think this is finally going to turn into is finally a Brian Kelly offense, which is a lot of tight ends, right? So Mason Taylor was not exactly healthy last year. And the year before, he was the only tight end on the roster. Now we're looking at, you know, trade as green, LSU's highest rated recruit uh, well before everything happened with the portal this cycle. Uh, we're talking about all these guys that have been in the system learning how to play tight end. So I think we're going to see more two tight end sets. I think we're going to see more power. And we're going to see the guys on the outside talking about C.J. Daniels, the transfer from Liberty, um, Aaron Anderson, all, all the guys coming back. Hilton, my guy. But there's one guy in the offense that I think is not being talked about enough. 
I think Logan Diggs left not because of opportunity elsewhere, but because Caleb Jackson is horrifying. That was the guy that ran over that Mississippi State player. That was something's up with that guy. Yeah. 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 Something's up with that guy. That is a guy who, and he had a bad drop during the Alabama game. I get it, but he, there's something to that guy. I think the running offense, because of the offensive line, now you're going to have year two of Jackson. I think the running offense will actually be better um, because the lineup was so strange last year. We just didn't know who was playing. We're not going to get any Noah Kane touches this year, unfortunately, which is the guy that and we loved him. But at the end of his career, he was just so plodding that he was not a game changer. Yeah. Caleb Jackson could be that guy, and hopefully he can stay healthy. Now, I say that to say this. He's still going to take chances. We talked about that. He's still going to take chances. He's still going to have way more turnovers than Jaden Daniels, even though he's not running the ball or taking as many snaps. Now, that being said, on defense, Blake Baker plays this really aggressive style. I've talked about it before. You are accumulating these players to this style, um, and it's it's going to be risky. The style is risky. It's blitzing. It's sending lots of guys. You're going to have lots of guys in one-on-one coverage. I don't know who LSU starting corners are, as I sit here right now, because so many guys got injured and played for Matt House, which is injury itself. It's like a mental injury that you you don't know what we have. Zy Alexander was pretty good last year. We had people, we had three people go down before the season even started. We don't even know who the DBs are. That's that's why. And the other thing is LSU's not done it on the portal. They've been they have money. They've been giving it to coaches. They had the one receiver, like I talked about, but I don't know who's playing corner. I know it's going to be the same two sorry safeties. Um, <laughs> Might not be. They they got the, uh, J.K. Johnson, the Ohio State, the former Ohio State transfer, who missed the, the entire year too. Like they they yep. have and they they had what true freshmen starting in the bowl game at corner, yep. uh, which obviously is not a, ideal. But they actually have eight or nine guys that played somewhat significant snaps that you would look at and go, okay, these guys can't be that bad. They, right. They, they can't be that bad. Zy Alexander was a good player before he got hurt. And as tough as it was to watch at various moments, like how much of that is because, okay, well, they can't generate any sort of pressure whatsoever. And these guys are getting significant time to be able to throw. Like, I don't think there's any world in which Harold Perkins is playing twice as many snaps in coverage as he does rushing the passer this upcoming year. If that yes. happens again, Blake Baker is going to be one and done at LSU. I'll say that. Man, yeah, just for the optics of it. And that was always the problem with Matt House is just the failure to adapt. And he died. Um, I mean, well, he got $4 million. He's better off than us. But Basically. anyway, <laughs> yeah, he'll be fine, uh, especially per talent. Anyway, but where I'm going with that is the defense, it will be better, okay? Will it be 80% better or 20 that's going to lie in a lot of things. One position that is genuinely a position of need is defensive tackle. Both offensive tackles, we talked about it in one of the last pods, declared for the draft. They have Bo Davis. Hopefully they can go get some guys there. But we, LSU does not know who they have from a personnel standpoint because exactly what you just said, all these guys have reps. We've seen lots of the guys. It's all been pretty much bad reps because Matt House was a doofus. Um, so we have Corey Raymond coming in. He's just now meeting most of these guys because they weren't here when he was. And, you know, at Florida, in his last two years at LSU, it's not like he was this great schematic fundamental coach. I'm not going to pretend like he's Dave Aranda, like he's this schematic genius now that he's back on our staff. So all of that being said, the aggressive style, the opening door corner, the revolving door, uh, Corey Raymond not being known for like being a guy who can turn around a defense in one year. I do think the defense is still going to struggle next year, right? especially with, again, no defensive tackles, um, and, and we'll see. But I think that the offense will probably be about 20% worse. If the defense could be about 50% better, which from the worst defense in America is really – it's middle of the pack is a better way to say that. Um, they could be right there. But I will say that like I do expect this to be uh, a little bit of a down year for LSU just because last year they were able to ride Jaden Daniels. They have some first-time coordinators. They have changed all these different coaches positions i think that 2025 is going to be a huge year for lsu but there are going to be some moments next year where i really think lsu is going to not look like a good football team because of all the turnover let the record show i said that lsu should have preseason playoff expectations and will is like no no yes that's probably not fair okay yes all right. and and i will say this quickly the lsu fan base people on twitter national media they're going to dump on LSU when they struggle next year, and they're going to be right because, like, here's a great transition from the last point. Mizzou has seven 10-win seasons ever. Brian Kelly has seven in a row, okay? When you bring that guy in, you have that expectation of a 10-win season. 10 is my number. It's not playoff. It's not any of that. If we can just get right back there, keep everybody in the boat for 25, then we can start talking about getting the defense playing winning football, not just surviving football. But I don't think you go from that horrific ter- – terrible defense to a team that can legitimately compete compete for a championship now i'm in the minority among lsu fans because i love my people but they are really optimistic about that lsu football but yeah i i think i think you have the consensus i think most people would agree with you for sure okay all right that's i think that's perfectly fair i I don't see anything wrong with that let's go on oklahoma Mm -hmm. part of this is based on this historical trend that i just can't shake 
Oklahoma is coming off consecutive finishes outside of the top 10, which hadn't happened since 2011, 2012. The last time that Oklahoma had three consecutive years without a top 10 finish was 97, 98, 99. Basically, final two years of John Blake, first year of the Stoops era in Norman. Sometimes preseason expectations have history baked in. This one does. This one definitely does. But I wouldn't be saying that unless Oklahoma did not take a nice step forward in year two with Venables, which it did take a nice step forward. Four win improvement. The turnaround against Texas is worth noting as well. You lose Dylan Gabriel. Jeff Levy isn't running the offense anymore. There are a lot of Oklahoma people that feel like this offense, even though it was fourth in the country, is going to be just fine. And they will not necessarily shed a tear over the loss of those two guys because they're really high on Jackson Arnold with three of those top four receivers back. They added Deion Burks, all Big Ten guy from Purdue. Plus, you've got two All-Americans that are returning for a Brent Venables defense. Danny Stutzman, Billy Bowman. After That group was horrible in year one, and they improved by a touchdown per game. They actually didn't finish particularly well. I blame Noah Fafita for that. It's kind of tough to count Noah Fafita numbers against you, but nonetheless, we have to. Mm -hmm. Um, I will admit... I am not projecting Oklahoma to make the playoff. I'm not doing that. But I'm saying because of history that that is part of this. But the schedule, man, seven FBS teams on that schedule won at least nine games last year. That is tough sledding. Tulane, Tennessee, Texas, Ole Miss, Mizzou, Bama, LSU. Three of those games are on the road. Neutral site for Texas, obviously. At the same time, there's just there are certain programs that – have enough 21st century success that we should just assume playoff in the 12 team era or new year six bowl is the expectation until they fall off a cliff and tell us otherwise. Oklahoma is one of those teams because when you finished as a top 10 team, 16 times in the 21st century, including eight of the last 11 seasons, we can say that. So that's, I I try not be too vague. Maybe that's, that's too vague for expectations and it's not, digging into some of the weaknesses and some of the questions that we have. But I do think it's fair to say, hey, if Oklahoma is is on the outside looking in, there will be some very disappointing, some very disappointing, disappointed is the word I'm looking for, fans in Norman. Yeah, this is another one to kind of handicap, right? Because the era you talked about was the Bob Stoops era, a little bit of the Lincoln Riley era, right? Another guy who just stopped carrying halfway through a good season. Good amount of the Lincoln and Riley era, though. Like a yeah. good amount of it. I mean, we're we're still talking about a, a five year stretch from 17 to 21 yep. where money in the bank, get them to a New Year's Six Bowl. They're winning the Big 12. Like that, that is, it's not that far removed from it to say, like, oh, we, well, we, we, just we, we can't include that as we talk about this team in a current context. It's funny because whenever you say money in the bank, I think about Mark Stoop saying it. I thought we're talking about Bob Stoop. <laughs> Put your money in my bank. <laughs> that is anyway. a throwback for the OG oh, yeah. listeners of this show. Put your money in this bank. That's actually a Bo Pelini joke. I know it's a sensitive subject for you, but wow. classic moment <laughs> in the history of the Saturday Night South podcast. Yes. Uh, but point being, you know, that, that level of stability really barely happens anymore in college football. So it's hard to project that exactly, exactly what you just said. It's like – the logo, it's the opposite of Ole Miss. It's like yep. when I see that Oklahoma logo, I know what they're going to do. They're going to maybe lose one game. They're going to be putting up a ton of yards against nobodies, and then they're going to get to the playoff and struggle. Well, Venables has built a team that I think can win in a playoff format. I think that the physicality they played with, I think that's something he's brought to the table. Now, that being said, are maybe they're getting that thing where they're a little bit more of a playoff team versus a regular season team, which is crazy that I'm saying this about college football, but – you know, they haven't been a consistent winner under um, Venables. Now, that being said, to take a team as soft as a Lincoln Riley team is, and we're seeing that now in California. I mean, that is a soft as, you know, you know what out there Shawn team. Yep. <laughs> yeah, sh- yeah, tin ply, as I say on Le- Letter Kenny. But point being, like, I – that's a big cultural like shift. And and honestly, we were too high on him year one to and to now see the gargantuan job it took him in the year two to get all the get the losers out of here. We always talk about it, get the losers out of here, get the winners in here, get your guys. So as much as I want to predict him to be right there, um, and I, I think that's fair for Oklahoma. I mean, so without Dylan Gabriel, I, I know they have like the big recruit coming in. I mean, is there a scouting report on him? Like what's the quarterback projection to look like? On on I mean, Jackson Arnold, what he did in the bowl game is mm-hmm. giving Oklahoma fans optimism. I don't want to say quite like Tennessee, but it's not. I mean, it's it's similar. It's both yeah. five-star guys who step in there, and you're like, 
well, crap, we've seen this before. We've seen what it looks like when it works. And that's kind of why it was like, all right, well, yeah, Dylan Gabriel is going to, going to do his thing. He's going to move along and grateful that he spent two years here that he did, but on to, to bigger and perhaps better things, guys with higher upside that can make even more throws. And I, I like Dylan Gabriel. I think he's a tremendous college player, but yeah. that's kind of the expectation is that this offense should not have some, some like cliff that it falls off. Seth Luttrell, who is a psycho of a human being, the former North Texas coach, who's not going to be running that offense. Like they are still feeling like, Hey, we belong. We're going to be part of this, this playoff hunt. We're going to be in that conversation. We're not all of a sudden just going to go back to being some seven and five team, but mm -hmm. the schedule is just tough. It is brutal for a first time starting quarterback. You know what you've, uh, this was, like I said, I was talking about this off, off air. Sometimes our minds just completely come together. So this is a team that will be disappointed if they miss the playoff but they maybe shouldn't based on it being their first year in the SEC and their schedule. Because True. you fully just convinced me if they had, you know, Mizzou's schedule, you know, they would be a lock. Because you're right. If the defense, as we keep talking about, the defense is the hardest thing to rebuild. If you get an offensive guy, and I love the example of Tennessee, which we'll get to them in a minute. I love the example of Josh Heupel coming in and say, I can play offense from day one. Okay, now this defense, and that's what they did last year. And like I said, we'll get to them. But Tennessee was buoyed by their defense last year. It was not their offense. So Venable is in the same way. If he can build that defense and just kind of, like you said, maybe have a top 20, maybe even a top 10 offense. I really do think this team is going to be fun to watch, but the level of competition is something they're just not used to. And that was part of even the stoops years of just, okay, now I can make fun of Kansas. You're playing Kansas. You're playing army and struggling with them. There's not going to be, and this is the opposite of the, uh, of like the you know sweetheart schedule. This is like, let's see what you're about, Oklahoma. Y'all been talking mess for 20 years. Let's get you punched in the mouth of this SD schedule. So with a middling schedule, I would say yes, definitely. Only thing that's working against me here is just seeing teams for the first time so many times. Yeah, and it's worth noting, I I don't really like getting in getting into too many of the over unders, the the those projections with regular season win totals until we actually see post portal and so many different things can happen and injuries and stuff like that. So this is, that's kind of why we haven't brought that up. And Oklahoma is yeah. not going to have an over under of 10 wins. They won't. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you that right now. Neither will this next team. The Tennessee volunteers will. Mm -hmm. I'll get pushed back again here, but here's where the, the logic lies. Do I think Tennessee will be better than it was a year ago? Yes. If the expectation is improvement, we're talking about a team that finished 17th in the AP poll. Again, that was helped by the bowl victory, obviously. But playoff expectations are fair for a team that is 20 and 6 the last two years. I am very worried about all the pieces that they lost in the secondary. And I'm not I'm not going to just overlook the defensive concerns by saying what some were saying about LSU. Well, oh, Harold Perkins will just get to the quarterback every time. Oh, James Pierce Jr., he's just going to get to the quarterback every single time. You can't bank on that. You just can't. You you still need to be good enough on the back end. But what if he's working at the concession stand in Harold Perkins' case, was he working at the concession stand, or was he just kind of told, "Hey, go hang out over there. It's just don't kidding. actually do anything productive. You'll just stand over there, and eventually we'll get to you." That's yeah, kind of what you, it felt get like. Get you a coat. Don't rush the passer. Anyway, <laughs> soft pretzel. You like salt, Harold? Do you like salt? <laughs> That's a little bit what Tennessee's like. That, yeah. that that could be. Do I think this offense? gets back to the top eight level that it was at for the first five years that Josh Heupel was a head coach. I think it does. I think it does. And that's because I'm obviously bullish. I'm very, very bullish. I'm the man, the myth, the legend, Nico Yamaleava. We're going to say it over and over until everybody who listens to this show knows how to say his last name, Nico Yamaleava. I tell you what, Connor. I was in an Uber yesterday. This is a, actually a true story. I meant to text you about it, but I got off like, the Hawks, the Hawks game. I was like, "Hey, uh, you know, this guy was a Georgia fan. Of course, whenever somebody finds out I do this podcast, they always hit me with Georgia questions. <laughs> oh, that kid that Tennessee. I'm looking at my phone. Oh, okay, good, good kid, Tennessee. Yamaleaba, huh? Yamaleaba, yeah, that's his name. Oh, Nico, yeah, it just keeps going. I was like, listen, y'all go learn his name. <laughs> there is something so impressive about just busting that out and just. Saying it with confidence, say it with your chest, you know, mm -hmm. say it with your chest. Just like when I can rattle off the 92 dream team without skipping a beat. Say, <laughs> same thing. Say Iyama Leava. Gosh, I, I stumbled. Say Iyama Leava with your chest, with confidence. Mm -hmm. You can do it. Listener of this show. You definitely can. I love his surroundings though. That's, that's part of why I feel this good about the Tennessee offense. 
Love that Brew McCoy is back. Absolutely love it. I did my most important returning guys in the SEC who bypassed the NFL draft. First four guys, quarterback, kind of know where I'm going with that. But for my fifth spot, my my first non-quarterback, and I thought about Stutzman at, at Oklahoma. I can make the case that I should have just gone with another quarterback in Brady Cook and Mizzou. But I went with McCoy. And I went with McCoy because of how important he's going to be for Nico as that safety valve, as a guy that can push the football to outside the hashes where McCoy loves to be able to operate, a guy that blocks for other guys, is so, so valuable as a veteran returning in that room. You've also got Squirrel White. I have not sold my Squirrel White stock. Kind of quietly finished as the number eight receiver in the SEC. After a while, I was like, ooh, why did I say he was going to leave the SEC in receiving? I ended up having a better year than kind of it was looking like in September. He stepped mm-hmm. up after McCoy went down. But also, you add Tulane's top receiver, Chris Brazel, the second. He is on board. You've got a five-star true freshman wide out, Mike Matthews. You've got the tight end that they got from Notre Dame, who was the top tight end in the portal. He's going to be a big red zone guy. Love the potential of Dylan Sampson who ran for more yards than anybody did against that Iowa defense last year. He is the real deal. They'll be just fine without Jalen Wright. Tennessee has to split these four games. That's what this comes down to. You have to split the game that you have against a nine-win NC State team in Charlotte. You're at Oklahoma. You're home against Bama. You're at Georgia. Other than that, other than that, Kentucky is the only other team on that schedule who went to a bowl game. And Heupel is 3-0 against Stoops. Yep. So that's good. That's why I say it's it's all about those four games right there. Tennessee is the team that I can justify leaving off this list and saying, well, you know, if Tennessee goes eight and four, but Nico leads a top five offense, there is a ton of momentum, probably like knowing that he's coming back. You're like, all right, we're going to get more guys on the defensive side. We had to put some young guys in the secondary. We should be better. But I will still say that Tennessee should be better and Tennessee should have playoff expectations. You gave me a look. No, how do they have two bye weeks? That's interesting. Anyway, the schedule um, sets up weird because they have everybody playing in week zero. I hate that they're doing oh. it. It's strange. They have teams that are playing, like everybody's playing that August 31st. And so they're calling it a week zero, but they're kind of extending the season. It's it's a tough thing to figure out. Yeah, I. this is such, I mean, so here's the deal, right? This offense last year looked exactly like, I predicted it too when they got here. If you guys remember, first take I ever had on this podcast, and it was just so wrong, was about Josh Heupel not being able to score effectively in the SEC. Well, it took me a couple of years, but that was the exact offense I watched, right? Now, I will say, I'm not going to, I'm not doing this as if like I was right. I'm actually completely shocked that they were so ineffective with a quarterback named Bazooka Joe, who could throw the ball over them their mountains, unable to generate deep plays you know i mean that's squirrel white as much as we love him brew obviously with the injury so i actually think this team played way below the level last year uh that florida loss was kind of wild looking back again that's one of the traditions hand up didn't know how tough how they just never win there i guess but they just felt like a way better i mean they finished as a better team than florida that's not a secret but that's one of those you'd like to have back the bama game another one you'd like to have back so as as wild as this is i'm actually going to say that recent history for tennessee has proven that you know, stabilizing the defense for Josh Heupel was always going to be the big question. I think they answered that question last year. Um, I think that the offense, every Josh Heupel offense, I mean, I can say with almost certainty you could have any, like, FBS-level quarterback running that offense. And even, you know, lower than that, for sure. Uh, the dude that they started the bowl game with uh, against LSU was not an FBS quarterback. He ended up at, like, uh, somewhere random. The point being... Um, any guy with a pulse could do better than that offensively, especially with the deep ball. Now I say that to say, yeah, Maliava saw that guy play smooth, like butter it was yeah. smooth. It, it was the opposite of Joe Milton. He stepped with his feet intentionally. Every step he took, okay, his foot meant to go there. He wasn't rumbling around like the, the off platform throws that he oh. is going to make after that. That's just, that's not what Joe Milton does. That's not what he does. The off platform stuff that, that you're going to see. It is going to be like, oh my God, this is this guy's a unicorn. For I'm not saying for everybody in college football, there are there are plenty of guys in college football that can do that. But yeah. even ha- like Hooker, sometimes where you're like, he, he's good off platform, but he's not he's not getting the arm strength behind some of these throws in the way that Nico is. And that's to me where you really see like, okay, this guy's a five star for a reason. Yes, exactly. And that's the thing. I mean, I don't think anyone uh, would compare. 
like Tennessee's last two quarterbacks because they were just so different, right? Yeah. But I think this is where you start to see the more traditional Josh Heupel quarterback who is comfortable on the move. And I think that, you know, they figured out kind of in the back half of the season, well, if we just use Bazooka Joe as a battering ram and we can get like five yards of carry, we can make it part of the rushing offense. That was never the plan. Again, him moving his feet intentionally is not what he does well. Iyama Leava is a guy who naturally does that, who naturally, not only can he hit the deep ball, he can hit the deep ball off platform and not only can he hit the deep ball off platform, he can draw in the defense to where, you know, to be a threat with his legs. That's where you really see the magic in the offense that they had successfully with Hendon Hooker, which is that it was confusion across the whole defense because they didn't know, you know, if the running back, the numerous running backs were going to run the ball. They didn't know if Hooker was going to run the ball. They didn't know if there's going to be a screen pass or a deep play. Every play was like, we got to cover a little bit of everything. Last year, they became so one dimensional because they were unable to extend the defense. A guy like Yamaleyev is such a shot in the arm for that. So I actually think the University of Tennessee has fair playoff expectations. I know if you're a Georgia fan, you're a better fan. You said this is the second time in a row you're selling me some, you know. We didn't sell, oh, we didn't sell Tennessee hopium last year. We didn't we did right. that. That's yeah, a lie. But I'm talking about Joe Milton, right? We were both like, dang, it would be good if he was good. We really, like, we could not have anticipated how bad they were, the specific ways they were bad. Right? I think we were fair to Joe. I think, yeah. I, I, I do think that yeah. we were fair to Joe with preseason expectations. He was still very intriguing, and that yep. was still part of it, but we weren't sitting here saying, like, this guy's going to get to New York. Yep, 100%. You're right. We were, we were, it was almost, no, the media was overrating him, and we were pushing back. You're exactly right. But the whole thing in the back of the head was, well, just look at the measurables. He might be something. With Amalayava from the jump, it's been, Okay, this guy, when we saw him just in the Iowa game, which again, I mean, every Iowa, you know, every every big head coaching search, every big coaching search for a defensive coordinator has been, let's look at Iowa's guy. Let's look at sure. Iowa's guy. He, I believe he won the Joe Moore Award, right? Like he was at least right there. Or not the Joe Moore Award, the, um, come on, the Royals Award. Um, the assistant coach. Oh, award. Phil Parker, Phil Parker. Yeah, Phil Parker, exactly, yeah. And that's what, yeah, him and the Michigan guy, I was getting a little bit confused. But yes, that was one of the best defensive coordinators in America. And again, Iowa's issue was not defense. So him looking that way against an Iowa team that was so, I mean, it, it was kind of proving if it could hang in that type, type of situation and their offense couldn't get worse. So point being, you know, the way that he was able to move in his first start, the way he was able to show confidence against such a tough defense, I think was a really big deal for him. And again, the ability to pivot and adjust the game plan with a quarterback like that when things aren't going your way. It's not just like run forward the way it was with Joe Milton. It's like, okay, plan one doesn't work. You know, the scripted plays are going to work probably, even in the bad in the, in the bad hypo games. It gets Alabama, the scripted plays work, right? And then, okay, the next thing, is that going to work? Well, now we'll pivot off of that versus being stuck to this busted game script. So I think Tennessee's offense is going to be very fun next year, and I think their defense, for the first time last year, they actually showed me that the Josh Heupel defense can hang in there without the complimentary football. Because that was such the big thing is when that, this offense struggles, they get off the field. And this defense was good enough. It was on, honestly underrated how good that front uh, front four, even front seven were to say, okay, our offense stinks, can't move the ball, and gets it back to you in 30 seconds flat. We're going to need to stop that for like eight of 12 games. So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty big on Tennessee. I think they have expectations in their fans at this point, especially with a little bit of a down year considering 2022. I think they would be expecting a playoff appearance. Eight and four felt like a disappointment. Yeah. And if you have an offense that is opened up, then in theory, yeah. that should be on the table. Okay, last but certainly not least, a and I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's Bama. It's Bama. Can you imagine? I was like, waiting on the Wigman pitch. I was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> Connor Wigman, uh, I'm, look, I, I'm not quite in the top five yet with him in my quarterback. No. Um, Bama still should have play, playoff expectations. The playoff expectations for Bama are, in my opinion, one of those things that we need to see full evidence that this team is not part of that. Okay. And I realize the portal, everything that has happened is going to make some say that this, that this is just not the program that it was. And it's not the program that it was because the greatest mm -hmm. coach of all time stepped down. Okay. I thought about just talking about the portal losses, but I figured we'd get to it with this subject. Anyways, losing Caleb downs, Ken Proctor, significant, very significant. Downs is going to be an all American coming into next year. Proctor and Booker were, Supposed to be the anchors of that offensive line. Booker is still coming back, but still. I warned everyone that Bama was always going to get hit by the portal with big, big losses. Because if you're playing for a new staff anyways, why not handpick your, your next staff that you want to play for and yeah. make more money doing it? So that was going to happen. I know that's not what fans want to hear. That's reality. It's also reality that it doesn't matter how successful you are, either recently or historically, you're going to lose guys. Last night, I watched Catholics vs. Convicts for the third time. Oh, it's yeah. great. It's awesome. It's 
probably like a top five 30 for 30 for me. It's that good. It's so unbelievably well done. Even mighty Notre Dame had a mass exodus after Jerry Faust left his surprising. He had that, that resignation that everybody was just like, wait, what? Like even the team didn't know, like got to this yeah. press conference. It was like, yeah, I'm done after five years at the end of the 85 season. Lou Holtz in his first year basically told everyone, Hey, we're going to be playing walk-ons. We're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> they Actually, didn't... Rudy is a starter now, believe it or not. We <laughs> called him back. Uh, he's 35. Rudy's playing 55 snaps a game, <laughs> buddy. Get, get ready for it. Uh, yeah. They didn't take transfers at the time. They actually tweaked that policy. They also once said that if you couldn't get in as a student in Notre Dame, then you couldn't go there. But then Lou Holtz made up this policy where a guy could redshirt for a year, show that he could hang at Notre Dame academically, and then earn a scholarship, which is like a very 1980s Catholic school type way to go about it. But that's essentially I'm what sure happened. he was in there making phone calls like, you better give this kid an A so he can get on this team. Yes. He's already here. <laughs> you needed the influx of talent. You needed yeah. to be able to do this. That's what, what they did with, with their quarterback, Tony Rice. And my point is that nobody is immune to this. Nobody. And especially not now when transfer restrictions are virtually non-existent. There's the 30-day window where you're basically giving – all these teams an excuse to be able to tamper shout out to the NCAA. We're nearly three years into this whole like immediate eligibility for one-time undergrads with NIL on the table. And has there been a single tampering investigation by the NCAA? I don't think there's been one. There was a quote uh, to start that hearing about NIL today. And a congresswoman said like, I'm glad that we are now beginning to approach NIL. And it's like, yeah, we kind of are, aren't we? We're beginning right now. <laughs> like what we don't want is pay for play. Like, what do you, what do you think this is? How do you, how do you think this is all going down right now? Um, you know they're going to Miami, right? You know they're not there to win anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, Bama's going to get guys back in the portal. TBD on if that stupid, outdated rule for SEC transfers within conference play is going to be lifted. As you recall, you can't get SEC players to to transfer within the conference in the post spring window. That has to mm -hmm. change. It absolutely has to change. It's stupid. But that's I'll save that for a different time. Um, it's worth remembering. I saw David Hill retweet this. Bama had seven guys hit the portal since Saban retired, which is still less than Arizona had with 10. It's still less than Washington had with 17. So while it feels like the sky is falling because of the names that we have seen in the portal, let's remember that other schools are being impacted by this as well. The good news for Bama. You've got Milrow back. You've got the guy that I brought up before, friend of the program, Tyler Booker. You've got Malachi Moore coming back for what feels like his seventh year in college. He's been there for a long time. There should be leadership. And Kalen DeBoer is 12-2 and two against AP top 25 teams in four years as a head coach, two of which were at Fresno State. For me, that suggests that he is not James Franklin, who in 10 years, in 10 years at Penn State, has a total of 13 AP top 25 wins. Yes, I did take that as an opportunity to slander James Franklin. Or Lane, who in 12 years as a head coach, and we've said good things about Lane, so I feel like this is fine. This is balancing out. But in 12 years as a head coach, Lane Kiffin only has 10 wins against AP top 25 teams. Kalen DeBoer has more wins against top 25 teams in four years as a head coach than Lane. Hypo is nine, by the way. And then I went on a deep dive, and I'm like, gosh, now i got to do this for a bunch of SEC coaches. Stoops and Freeze have 13. Sark is up there. He has 17. Kind of sneaky been around for a while because the Washington years as well. Kirby has 33. BK, 34. Ahead of him by one. Look leader in the SEC. Current leader of all-time AP Top 25 wins. Kirby has also been a head coach for eight years. Uh, Kelly's been a head coach at the FBS level for 20 years, but that's neither here nor there. You know, man, it's all <laughs> conjecture. You know, conjecture. a win is a win. <laughs> yes. It is not national championship or bust in the first year post Saban. Something else I went into a, a, a deep dive on. When was the last time that we saw a first year head coach have national championship or bust expectations? Doesn't happen. Like, Larry Coker, 2001 at Miami, because you're yeah. like, oh, 2001 Miami, you better win a national championship. Even they were preseason number one. I think they're preseason number two. Like year one, Urban at Ohio State, they were on probation. They had the bull band. They were preseason number 18. Mark Helfrich at Oregon, 2013, that's kind of a sneaky one. They started yeah. off number three post Chip Kelly era because they had Marcus Mariota back. So many pieces returning from a team that finished number two in the country. Ryan Day, 2019 is one of those as well. But first year, Justin Fields is a starter. I don't necessarily know that it was fair to say that it was title or bust. 
but it's really hard to find those examples. Maybe less miles year one, like 2000. Like, are we talking about that 2005 team as national championship or bust expectations? Probably not, but still mm-hmm. one of those that you're like, it's going to be in the hunt championship or bust expectations for a year one coach is not fair. That's not the bar that we should set, even though it is Alabama, even though we're going to default to the logo, that's the way that it works. And yes, I know we're talking about a team that's got 13 consecutive seasons of 11 wins. So that's should set the floor somewhere. I am saying that Alabama deserves to have preseason playoff expectations, even though the 2024 schedule has road games against three teams who won at least nine games, plus a home game against Georgia. Fair or not fair? Um, I'm trying to do a good job finding these. What about Jimbo Fisher maybe at FSU? Mm-mm. No, yeah, because the roster is already cooked. Yeah, neither they Jimbo were, Fisher. I think, gosh, their last like three, four years with Bowden yeah, were not, not particularly good. good. I, I don't remember what they were. Now i got to look this up. Yeah, um, it's, I feel like they lost like an embarrassing. I feel like Bowden's last game was like a West Virginia bowl game or something, if I remember that correctly. It was, yeah, it was, they did not go out on a high note. I remember this. Um, but yeah, point being, I actually. Now, again, we get to the disappointment question. I, I'm right there with you. I think that it would be unfair to expect them to just turn overhaul this roster. Like I talked about it previously, it's like I don't think there was a lot more juice to squeeze out of this roster. I think they need to get new guys in. Um, I, I'm going to give them at least a year. You know, if I'm going to give that to Brian Kelly because of the, the whole roster turnover thing, I'm going to do the same thing. And, and all, the deal is all of the projecting – lands on guys that you know some guys that aren't hired yet you know you go through the filling out the staff the main guys are there right but some of the position coaches and all that type of stuff the players that aren't there yet i mean this is just such a and again i can be objective here and say it's you know it's funny or whatever that happened in alabama but you know objectively i could say it sucks that you know they were punished for making a playoff you know they were the only teams with an open portal window because their coach left and not, okay, if they had just played in some random bowl game, it would have been right next to the tra- – it would have happened around the transfer window to where everybody else was out there bidding on other players and recruiting and doing all this. It was just Alabama that ha- was yep. wide open for business. That's unfair. It's, it's messed it's, up. It's, you know, it's messed up. I mean, as much as I want to say Bama's been lucky or whatever, for some, it's, if that happened to – this is how you know a little bit objective because if that happened to anybody, imagine if that happened to your team and your Georgia, you'd be like, the NCAA's got it out for me. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it's stupid. It, it really is. And so – and it's funny because, you know, while I can say – okay, the rule does make sense that players aren't stuck with a coach they don't like, right? You can also kind of fix that and say, okay, maybe we could adjust the timing. Maybe we could adjust how this, these other things work, you know, tertiarily to fix that. So that being said, you know, I can't sit here and have all these questions right now about Alabama, but seeing them play a, a football game and then go, oh well, yeah, I think it's a huge disappointment to me if they don't make the play all these guys are fraud. I expect this to be, I, you know, a nine, hopefully 10 win team. Um, just like they were, in my opinion, like we talked about, supposed to be last year. Um, and I think that's with a ton of roster turnover. I mean, you know, obviously having Milro helps a ton. That's a later of your offense. Getting those linemen out of there is probably good. You know what I'm saying? In some ways, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I don't think it's good. Hey, Proctor was a great recruit. I get it. The dude, um, oh gosh, what was the guy that gave the quote that was a leader who was on there for media days? He's going to the draft. He's going to be like a top 15 pick. JC Latham. Yeah. JC Latham, hey, he's going to get drafted high. Whatever you guys did together, you know, the center, get out of here. You know what I'm saying? Like, whatever you guys did together, you need to blow it up. That's what else you did. They started the freshman to tackle. Like, I don't care what you guys did. You sucked last year. So that might be a good thing. But point being, you know, I we don't we haven't seen this team take a snap. We haven't seen who the starters are going to be. Most of them, I mean, might be on the roster. But the key few, how many starters are really impact players? Four, five, six, even on a great team, right? So you look at you know up and down those Georgia rosters throughout the year. Yeah, they had a lot of depth, but the guys that were the stars that put them over the top against great teams in these big matchups, there it's only a handful of guys. So they need to find almost all those guys outside of you know Milrow, outside of a couple, few of the guys they have left outside of the, some of the guys coming in from the recruiting class. So I think this is a transitional year, no matter how you spin it. As much as they're going to get in the in the spring cycle, I think that we need to start judging DeBoer for sure off of season two, just like. Napier. We don't judge your one coaches. We don't exactly. judge your one coaches on the show. We don't do that. Yeah. Yes. And even a bad season, even a seven oh, win, or, you know, I mean, a seven win season, there's a version of life where a six win season, I wouldn't be completely out on the board, just to be honest with you, because we've seen teams look at uh, Venables, you know? Six Venables, and seven. Yeah. Six and seven. It was six and seven. And then year two, we talked about how they got all the losers out. They got the culture. So I'm going to be fair and say, I'm not going to say I see these, tr- these challenges. And then at the same time, well, if you don't make the playoff, it's a failure. If you keep your head above water, if you get recruiting, though, that's what I'm looking at is I know these guys can coach. I almost am sure. Can you get the recruiting in late to where you're at least in the conversation, you know, of the top five recruits, almost all of them are either favored or going to 
LSU, Alabama, and one's going to Auburn or favored to. You know what I'm saying? You are coming into a deficit. So you need to make up that time and you're not going to be winning while you do it. You need to do two things at once. You know? And that's further down the road. That's further down yeah. the road in, in a different discussion. So the eight teams who are worthy of preseason playoff expectations, Bama, Georgia, LSU, Mizzou, Oklahoma, Ole Miss, Tennessee, and Texas. Non-bowl teams like Arkansas, Florida, Mississippi State, South Carolina, Vandy. I don't need to explain to you why you don't have playoff expectations. I'd say you can't make the playoff. We're living in a different world of sport, but I'm not going to sit here and say that you should have those expectations. Bowl teams like Auburn, Kentucky, A&M. Uh, Kentucky, when you're a team that has three, no, two winning seasons in SEC play since the Jimmy Carter administration, a little bit different. A and M, we're talking about a year one coach, a lot of roster turnover. Uh, Auburn beat New Mexico State, or just stay on the same field with them, and then we can talk about making the twelve team playoff. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I landed with this. So I know that was that was long winded, but I think worthy of kind of setting the table uh, for a lot of these discussions uh, in the SEC. It's tough when it gets to sixteen, man. It's it's yeah, that's man. what I'm like adjusting to right now, doing some of these SEC wide things. I'm like, man, there's a lot of meat on the bone for sixteen teams in a conference. Okay. Yes. And uh, sorry, one more note on the Bama thing. Remember, I know the world's a different place, but in this way, it actually hurts you. It didn't help you. Remember, Saban was not good in year one. <laughs> I just want to be clear. That was a 7-5 team, Different right? Different inheritance of what Saban took over then versus what DeBoer's taking over now. No, no, I agree. But I'm saying now everybody can read this roster. It's not you got an open season sure. to go compete with people. Uh, yeah, it's a new era, but this is the only time I'm going to use that example because you're so right. Same thing with Kirby Smart. Say different era, but now you have the opposite where you can't go get guys out of the portal. They can come get your guys. So it's almost like a negative advantage for DeVore. Yeah, very true. And Bama will still be able to get non-SEC guys in the post-spring window. I would expect yeah. there to be a feeding frenzy with that. All right, let's kick it to Aaron Murray. Great catching up with him. Talk Carson back. Some, some Bobo Crow that I ate. A little Caleb Downs and more. So here's Aaron. Now excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is the one and only Aaron Murray. Aaron, I thought for a very brief moment, next time I have you on, I'm gonna bring some champagne. We're gonna we're gonna pop a bottle in your honor because for a brief moment, it looks like Will Rogers was off to mm. Washington. That would keep your SEC passing record intact after it looked like he was gonna smash it. Last time we talked on these airwaves, that was pretty much a foregone conclusion that you were in some trouble. Now he doesn't look like he is going to be staying at Washington. He's at least in the portal. Mm -hmm. So the possibility has opened back up. Do you have alerts on your phone for Will <laughs> Rogers transfer portal news? I should. I should put up some like Google notifications if there's anything Will Rogers S that comes out. Uh, I do have his number. I should just hit him up. I'm like, dude, like, come on, let's be serious. You told me on the field, second to last game of the season, I had their game. I went up to him and said, listen, your records are safe. Yep. And obviously, I'm not going to say it. I'll let you make that announcement. But I was like, yes. I was like secretly in the booth calling the game that, that day. I just had a little bit more energy uh, calling, calling Mississippi State Bulldogs. So, yeah, I was very excited to see him leave the SEC. And now Saban just retired a year too early. He retired a year too early and started this domino effect and opened up the door for him to possibly come back to the SEC. Uh, I was playing this game the other day with some friends. I'm like, but where would he go? Yeah. Like where would – he's not going to Alabama. Where would – if he wanted to come back to SEC, like where – Arkansas? That's the only one. That's yeah. the only one at yeah. this point. And even like Vandy. Vandy added two portal guys. They got the New Mexico State kid, the Hugh Freeze mm -hmm. killer, and then they got Nate Johnson, the kid from Utah, who beat Florida in the opener but then got benched for the pig farmer. Um, but, yeah, I think you're. I think you're good. I still think you're good. I, you, it's well, going like, to be why, fine. Why, 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 nothing against Arkansas. Like, why would you want to come back into this conference knowing how difficult it is and knowing you are just at a place very similar to Arkansas and how tough it is to win football games and then have to learn a new off? Like, it's just like, why, why not go somewhere? And I'm like, I'm like, I'm trying to be genuine here, not like trying to force him out of the SEC. <laughs> like, why would you not go somewhere where you know I'm going to have a hell of a football season? The appeal at Arkansas would be Robert Patrick Petrino, obviously, getting to work with him, which, look, everybody dogs A&M and says, oh, it didn't work. Their offense improved by 11 points per game. Oh, yeah. And their quarterback oh, yeah. position was much, much better with him on board than without him. So, like, that would be the one probably thing that I'd leave open. But it looks like they're, I don't know, maybe they're going to make a post-spring move. Who knows? Never say never in this day and age with mm. the roster move. Mm. But do you know how many yards away uh, he is from your, from your record? Do you have that number in mind? 
I don't. I feel pretty good about the touchdowns, though, even if he came back. I think the touchdowns, I think he has to get close to 30 yeah, in order to break there. the touchdowns. I think yardage is something that he would be able to get. I think a couple thousand, I want to say, somewhere around there. Maybe just over two. Aaron, it's 851. Oh, never mind. Less than a thousand. I think it's, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 851. I thought it was, maybe that was like before I covered his game, uh, middle of the season two, it was around there. So, wow. Yes, don't come back. I, I just want the touchdowns. So, like, if I had to pick one of three, the touchdowns is my baby. So, like, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly give the other one up. I don't want to, but um, I will. That's okay. That's very gracious of you. Very unselfish. Uh, it, as you mentioned, this this happens because Saban retires, and, and the mm-hmm. domino effect is obviously real. It's being felt across college football. Do you have a, a favorite Saban interaction? Like, did he give you words of encouragement after like 2012 ICC championship? Like, I hate to always bring that up with you, but yeah. is there is there something that stands out with him? No, I mean, I, I didn't really get to interact with him a ton. You know, pre you know pre even like now as a, as a as a broadcaster when I get to interview him every now and then before games or SEC media day stuff like that. The the only interaction I can remember during my time at, at Georgia was. Uh, the summer before that year, so 2012 summer, we are at my boy David Andrews, uh, his parents have a lake house at Lake Bird. You know, Saban has, at the time, he had two houses. I think he sold one of them. I don't, I don't know if he's the other one or not. But anyways, so we're driving the jet skis around. So we, you know, well, let's go see if Saban's there. It's summertime, everyone's out. And uh, we saw him in his backyard. So we, we drive up and, you know, he comes down and we, we're chatting and he's asking how we're looking and we're like, yeah, we look pretty good, man. We got, we got a good team. <clears throat> got this kid named Jarvis Jones who terrorized me in practice every day. He's going to get the play. So excited to see what he looks like Got all these pieces. Like we think like the East is, is we have a chance to win the East, you know, very confident and probably give away way too much information to be honest. <laughs> Anyways, he, so we asked, it was like, so you know, how, how are you guys looking? How is spring? How is, you know, summer been going? He's like, man, there's just like, a lot of questions still, a lot of you thought of positions that we're not sure about some battles that are going to be interesting during fall camp. But like, man, he's like, honestly, guys, like, I'm going to be real. Like, I just don't think it's our year. And we're like, we, we drove away. Like, yeah, like, at least we don't have to worry about Saban in Alabama this year. And, you know, fast forward five, six months, they beat us in Atlanta and go on the way to the national championship. So he hustled me. Nick Saban hustled me uh, back in 2012 at Lake Burn. Unbelievable. I fell for it. I think you are not alone. I, I think you have a different experience in not being alone because obviously when you're you know going up against these teams, it's a little bit different. But going up against those defenses and being like, where where are the holes? You you, yeah. you promised me holes in your mm-hmm. team in 2012. Like, man, they, they did not really have a whole lot mm-hmm. of them because that that group, like even what they had to do down the stretch to be able to get to a national championship, all that stuff with with beating you guys. It, it it truly was uh, impressive. Did you have any moment where you thought Rick could be going down a similar road? Like to like what was there ever a time where there was a rumor where you had to just get clarity from him, being like, mm-hmm. "Hey, like you're not you're not going anywhere, are you?" Because you just never know with coaches that have been yeah. there for for a decade, and it just doesn't happen very often. I never felt like that with, with, with Rick, obviously he was in great health. Um, you know, a lot of energy, if anything, he, he started to do more on the, the back end of my time at, at, in, in Georgia. So the first couple of years, he was truly the CEO. I mean, he was, you know, he learned it from, from, from Bobby Bowden at Florida state, you know, just drive around the golf cart, wear the hat, hang out, talk to boosters on the side, you know, do all the politicking and let my OCDC kind of do their thing. And, you know, I felt like heading into junior year, senior year as well, he, he, he missed being a part of the game plan. He missed part of being a part of the quarterback meetings. He missed being with us in drills. And, and you saw a different Mark Rick of, of, of just being more involved. So like, I never felt like, like this guy was losing interest. This guy was, you know, kind of, you know, fading away from wanting to even coach. Like if anything, like he felt rejuvenized and, 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 and re-energized to, 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 to be out there with us each and every day, which was awesome just to get his eyeballs on me and, and Coach Bobo's eyes on me just to continue to kind of tweak me here or there, uh, you know, both in and, 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 and during the offseason. So, no, if anything, it was always Bobo, you know, because we did have, and I know a lot of people are going to laugh at this, you know, we had a great offense. I mean, we were a top three or four offense every single year. And Bobo was young, good offense coordinator, putting up great points, was under the tutelage of Mark Rick, who was, you know, got his job because he was a great OC at Florida State. So it was like, okay, is Bobo going to leave at some point? Like that was always my worry 
just because like, man, I didn't want to learn a new offense. Like I, I knew the offense. I knew the checks. Uh, him and I worked really well together. He trusts me a lot with the game plan. And, you know, I just didn't really want to go backwards at any point. And fortunate for me, he didn't take that job at, at Colorado State until I think 2015. I saw you talking about it on snaps about how it might upset a lot of people to hear that you didn't commit to the G. You know, you talked about like, you know, you grew to love Georgia as a Tampa kid after getting there and after, you know, seeing the love and seeing all the tradition associated with the program. But like, is that something that you ever thought about realistically of, okay, if this happens, and I know it's a popular topic of conversation with how much movement there is in the portal right now, but like if Bo was gone, if Rick's gone, like what, what does that look like for me? Did you ever even have to sit down and make a, a list of like, all right, what are the things that I would consider? It's a different world mm-hmm. now than it was yep. then with the portal. But what was, what was that hypothetical like for you throughout your playing career? Cause I imagine it had to come up at some point. I think the only time it came up, I, I remember it was it was before freshman year, and it was the quarterback battle. It was between me and Menberger. This was before, you know, he got in a little bit of trouble and got dismissed from the team. But I mean, there was a real conversation of like, if I don't win this battle, like I'm not staying here. Yeah. Um. You know, like I love Georgia. I've 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 you know, got some great friends. I'm enjoying it. I've been here for at that time would have been two years because I was an early enrollee, then redshirted. But like, if I don't win this battle, like I'm not going to play. You know, we're the same age. So like, I got to get, you never want to lose to a guy your age or a guy younger. So like I had real conversation with my parents of, of if this doesn't happen, obviously we would probably look elsewhere, uh, you know, got the job, didn't have to worry about it. But I don't know, like I, my, my mom has asked me, we've, we've talked before my parents and I about this, this whole topic of NIL transfer portal. And if I was say, you know, a junior, you know, coming off my sophomore year, I threw 30 something touchdowns. And if I would have been like, you know what, let, let me hit the open market. Like, let me see what I could get on the open market and, and maybe even, you know, push Georgia to offer me some more money. I, I, I don't, I really don't know if I would do it. Um, I, I think pre committing, I would have really tested probably NIL. You'd be silly not to, but I think starting at a university, especially a major university like a Georgia or an Alabama or a Texas or Ohio state, or Michigan, if you're like a, a bona fide starter and 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 the guy, one, you're probably gonna get paid already, even if it's not the, the, the same amount. But like I wouldn't want to lose the reputation. Like that's something that that like I am a Georgia kid now. And I never would have thought about that, you know, 15 years ago before I committed to Georgia. I I you know, my dad told me this. He's like, you need to think about where do you want to live when you're done playing ball. I was like, Well, I want to live back in Tampa. I want to come home. I want the weather, I want the beach. He's like, trust me, it ain't going to happen if you go to Georgia. So I was like, yeah, well, uh, me being 17, I was like, whatever, I'll figure it out. And I don't, I, I, I'm a Georgia kid now. I live in Georgia. I live in Atlanta. My, I want to raise my kids here. I want my kids to go to Georgia. My wife went to Georgia. Uh, so like it, it, it shaped who I was. So for me to, you know, after two or three seasons, have just essentially have thrown that away for a couple extra bucks, I don't think I would have done it. For me, it would have all been pre-committing to university. And it's, you know, it's something that Lane brought up a couple of years ago with Bryce Young about why didn't Bryce Young hit the portal after his Heisman season just so that he could get more money. And I think with any other position, I, I would totally 100% get it. You're trying to maximize mm-hmm. your value. You don't know what's in store for, for yourself at, at the pro level. And I, I get it for, for plenty of these quarterbacks, but for a lot of these guys where I, I think that sends a certain message. I think it sends mm-hmm. a certain message to your, your, verse, your own university, to your locker room that you're obviously so much in charge of, of having that command. And and I think that there are other factors associated with, with a quarterback that's established mm-hmm. like you were. Um, did you have a, a place in mind? Like, would you have gone back to the recruiting well and been like, oh, UCLA or like, oh, hey, I'm going to go back to, because the Florida thing, we've talked about that a lot. Yep. That room was just loaded at the time. Like mm-hmm. I'm trying to even think of what would have made the most, you could have just flipped with Mettenberger and you could have done the LSU thing. Yeah, I could have done the LSU thing. Uh, but the thing is then, if you you could not have transferred directly to an SEC school. So he did, True. Met went Juco route, Juco to SEC. So I would have had to um, essentially leave the conference one way or the other in order to play. I think that's what the full rule was. Like regardless, you could not transfer within a conference. At least that's what the SEC rules were. So, um, you know, maybe... Heck, maybe like a UCF or USF, you know, maybe a Miami. I mean, get back. You know, I probably would have been leaning towards if I'm leaving, I'm going back to the state of Florida, yeah. uh, Florida State. Uh, go somewhere there, sit out a year behind EJ, 
then maybe take over after he leaves. Uh, good thing I did it because there's a guy named Jameis Winston who who came in was pretty darn good there in, in Tallahassee. So I, I mean, options are great. Listen, I'm I'm all for kids having the ability to make these decisions nowadays. Like I was a player. I understand it. I was in the locker room. I saw a bunch of my buddies that, you know, would have benefited from getting a fresh start, but I feel like the pendulum has swung so far in favor of players that it, it, it has gotten to me, it being a little bit too aggressive. Um, I would like it for it to kind of come back a little bit just so we can start to clean up college football a little bit right now, as we kind of move forward to this new era. This 30 day window that these teams with new coaches are, are dealing with. It's tough. And Bama is experiencing that in a, in a way that I, I think a lot on the outside are saying, Hey, you, you know, this is, this is what everybody else is dealing with. And now finally you're having to deal with mm-hmm. it. I'd argue not everybody is losing a player of Caleb Downs' caliber. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone at this time that we're recording this is assuming that he is off to Georgia, TBD on that. Maybe by the time people are listening to this official, whatever. Uh, let's pretend it is. If it is Caleb Downs teaming up with Malachi Starks, you know mm-hmm. that Georgia's got the best safety duo in the country, probably the mm-hmm. two preseason All-Americans at the position. Take me into the mind of a quarterback knowing that those two are on the back end? Like, how do you attack a secondary knowing that those two guys are are there over the top? Well, let's not forget. I mean, you, you're returning, you know, to your best defensive linemen, veteran linebackers. And, and the hard part is, you know, those guys, and because the, the you know, what Downs was doing at, at, at Alabama is going to be very similar to what they're doing at Georgia. So it would be a pretty quick, okay, here's the playbook, pretty much same terminology, same ideas, plug and play. Like, he'll be ready to go. So you're not having to – to ease him into the situation. Like it's going to be full throttle. And if you watch Georgia football over the past, you know, two, three years, and they've had great, uh, tremendous safety play. I mean, Chris Smith was a hell of a safety. Obviously Javon this past year, moving from nickel to safety was great. Malachi has been in a freaking stud since he stepped foot on campus a year and a half ago. So what they do, especially with the veteran guys is, is the, 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 the disguises is the hard part. You know, those guys are so fast and so smart that, you know, it, it just, it plays tricks on your mind as a quarterback. You know, I, I was fortunate. Like when I, when I played, you know, there was only a handful of coverages. I mean, you saw the basics. We saw, you know, cover one quarters, cover two, a little cover three, you know, saw your base blitzes, but you know, now the Georgia's the world's and then, you know, the, the Alabama's the world's like they play that like hybrid front where you could do a lot more with your pressures, which then allow you to do a little bit more with the coverages on the back end. So now all of a sudden, Perfect example. I always remember this interception from Chris Smith first first Clemson. Anytime you, to me, you get two guys coming off an edge. You know, you're you're bringing say a nickel and a Mike linebacker. Usually, a team will roll down to cover three. It just that's just that's base blitz going mad and going into football. You bring two, you go to cover three, backside corner, backside tape. He takes the middle third. Um, defensive end drops out. Then the 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 will linebacker gets the middle of the field. Georgia. The first time I've ever seen this brought that blitz and then ran a cover two. So let me, sorry for the, the tangent here. No, but no, we no this, would always, this is good we, stuff. Keep going. We, we would always do what we call, we'd say takes two. So like if we were in a two by two formation, I would, I would say, Hey, hey to the slot receiver, Hey, takes two. If both those guys come, you're going to run a, a hot route. It would be like a skinny slant because when the safety comes down to replace the nickel, He's playing outside leverage because his responsibility is, is curl flat. Um, so like you can hit that little skinny slant, bam. So fast forward to Georgia Clemson, you go, they bring in two. So I think Clemson had the same check. Hey, those two guys come run a skinny slant because we know we're going to have leverage on the, the safety coming down. Georgia runs an inverted cover two. When you're in cover two, the nickel has inside leverage. So the safety actually came down inside because the backside safety is so damn fast that he was able to get all the way across the field to play cover two. The backside corner became the new safety, and then the backside defensive end became the new corner. It was wild. It ended up being a pick six because as a quarterback, you're thinking, okay, cover three, bam, hot, completion, seven, eight yards. Instead, they roll to cover two, like stuff like that that they're able to do because they're experienced, they're fast. The front allows them to drop guys in certain positions, turn a defensive end into a corner. Um, It's crazy, man. I I love their defense, uh, but it takes players, and they have the players to be able to execute a lot of those systems. 
people wonder why DJ Uyangale saw ghosts that year with Clemson. <laughs> I, I, I will always go to bat and say that that Georgia defense messed him up. Like they mm. did things that messed mm. him up the rest of that year. Mm-hmm. And it has taken him a while to be able to kind of get back and be mentally in the right place. And all those things you describe, it's almost like, you know, back you know, 10, 15 years ago, we're talking about if you have two all American safeties like that, as a quarterback, you're thinking, well, oh, crap, I can't leave this one out over the middle. I can't mm-hmm. throw certain routes because those guys are going to pop them and I might get my top receiver hurt on a bad yeah. on a bad play by me. And it's just totally different now. You're talking it's about all one coverage disguise. Exactly. It's all coverage disguise. They like they they can cover so much ground that they can just sit there and cover two and then boom, all of a sudden it could be three or four different coverages at the at the at the snap of the football. It's like, do you go over the top with those two guys? Do you try and just say, hey, if we get that, mis- <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, like, I, I don't know. When you see the way that Downs, he tackles in the open mm-hmm. field, like, as a true freshman to do the things that he did, it's so unbelievably rare. And I, I just, uh, he he would present such a mismatch, and he's going to continue to present a mismatch mm-hmm. no matter where he lines up all the time. And for him to get with the right defensive scheme, is it just feels like a cheat code. It is. It is. I mean, they Georgia's defense. I mean, the, the secondary last year. I mean, they're, they're the two best secondaries, in my opinion, last year were, were Alabama, and you're going to see you know a couple of those guys get drafted in the first round, and then Downs as a safety there, you know Malachi Moore, and then Georgia's defense. You know, with with what they had with Javon and Kamari and and Tyke at nickel yeah. and, and Malachi. I mean, that you know they had a little bit of weakness on the backside. You know, some youth, some guys there rotating in and out, um, but like those two defensive backfields were two of the best in the country, like not many teams, if any teams threw the ball on Alabama, threw the ball on Georgia, um, you know, where Georgia got beat last year was just up front. I mean, it was, it was inability at times to get after the quarterback and, and, and the inability at times to stop the run. And especially versus Alabama, it's not like Alabama, like these gaudy numbers, but like we all saw Alabama moving bodies, taking double teams to the linebacker. So uh, I, I, if, if he, if he, if he didn't, transfer to Georgia, which once again, like we don't know if this has happened or not by the time this releases, but even if he didn't, I still think Georgia, you know, what would be, have one of the best secondaries in the country. But if he goes to Georgia, you have the best secondary in the country this year. You also have probably the number one safety in the draft 2025, the number one safety in the draft 2026 playing together. It's pretty good. It's pretty mm. good. Mm. Pretty good. Where do we land with, with Bobo? Um, I apologize. <laughs> I look. I admit it. You and you and my boy T Bob should just do a a a, a straight twenty minute Bobo bash podcast because the amount of times that he gives me crap about Bobo is look, almost as much as is as, as, as what I hear from you. I'm reformed. No, 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 no. I am reformed. I'm reformed. I've apologized. I haven't made a national championship prediction for next year, but. Bobo being in that role as OC is not going to prevent me from picking Georgia in the way that it did this past year. So I, I'm not doing a victory lap or anything like that. I wasn't doing anything after the Bama loss saying like, mm-hmm. oh, see, I told everybody. No, 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 no. I apologize. He did everything I hoped he would do. So I, I give him a passing grade, in my opinion, even if it wasn't quite at the level of Todd Munkin. But how would you evaluate what he did year one with that offense? Yeah, you bring up Todd Munkin. I was just about to bring that up. It doesn't help that Todd Munkin – is uh you know coaching right now the the number one team in the NFL with, with Baltimore. So you know if Baltimore wins the Super Bowl, people are like, oh, it was Munkin. So uh, no, I love I love Munkin. You know him and I had a good little relationship when he was at, in Athens, and you know happy for his success there in Baltimore. Um, but I mean, I, for those who who don't really have the ability to watch like the All Twenty Two, you know, so watching like the coach's camera, you know, as as a as a person who you know we're all trained psychologically to follow the football. Follow the football, follow the football, follow. Unless you like train yourself to to be able to see the entire picture, that's all you're really doing for most people, especially if you're watching at home, because that's all the camera's going to show you. But if you go back and watch the all twenty two, and I'm not trying to defend Bobo, maybe a little bit here, but like you could tell, like Georgia one was going against the best secondary in the country, but two they they just they weren't getting open, and 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 guys looked like they didn't look healthy. Lad didn't look healthy. I mean, you saw it midway through the game. Brock looked like a shell of himself for the way he was able to kind of move around. Like they just weren't at full strength. And that kind of, you know, inhibits a, uh, uh, you know, prohibits a coach from, from calling exactly what he wants to call. If he doesn't have his full, full arsenal ready to go. So, you know, I, it, it wasn't Georgia's best offensive performance. They weren't healthy. It may have not been Bobo's best offensive performance calling plays either, but um, I have full confidence in him. Uh, I think the majority 
And like vast majority, like 80% of Georgia fans, if not 90, have faith in Bobo that they can get the job done next year. And it, it's going to take a couple positions groups. I think has to really step up. Uh, I think running backs have to be a lot more consistent. Uh, and I think receivers next year have to be a little bit more consistent as well. Got the piece though, that that's all important and having Carson Beck back. Mm-hmm. I, I love what he became. And, and I know you've been high on him forever. Uh, I'm curious if there's a, a favorite throw that you had of his last year. Cause mine was that Florida one where he's backing up. He's got six oh, coming yeah. at him and that route that he hits to lad where I was just like, okay, it has clicked. And that was first mm-hmm. game without Brock. Like that, that to me was the moment where I, you really saw him take that next step as a thrower. Is there, is there one that kind of stands out for you? I, I wouldn't say one throw. I would say it's a certain concept that he just feels good with. And I've talked to him about this before. He, he, he just sees it well. And it's just, it's just a layers concept. It's a high, low read. You can do it a million different ways. You know, a lot of times Georgia will be in some type, sort of two by two, you know, have a post route to the front side, uh, a flat control with it, and then like a deep cross. And, you know, you could, you could throw the post around if you like it. If not, you're just kind of high, low in the flat defender with the deep cross. And I think Carson Beck throws that ball better than maybe anyone in the country that like 20 to 25 yards across the field keeps the guy in motion. I mean, the amount of times that he threw it where the guy doesn't have to adjust, he can just catch it in stride in that 25 yard play turned into a 50 yard play. Uh, just throw, he can throw it with touch. He could put some mustard on it if he wants to. Um, it's, it's a, It's a difficult throw. I mean, you're throwing the ball 25 yards down the field to a guy running full speed, and you have to maneuver it around linebackers and safeties, and he does it so darn well. So uh, that's that's my my favorite throw of him. makes me really jealous because I couldn't really do it that well, Um, but I also am not 6'4", 225 with a rocket arm. That's fair. That's fair. Let's take Beck off the board. And if I give you another SEC quarterback to build an offense around – and it's deep in the SEC. It's really, really yeah. deep. Who would you go with? Would you go Milrow, Ewers, Dart, Cook, Nico, maybe somebody else? I like Ewers a lot. I, I, I'm a big fan. And, and the thing that, that jumps off the page of me with Quinn is is the anticipation which he throws the football. Um, you know, got a little bit better with the deep ball towards the end of the season. But the one thing that, that you appreciate about him because you see how much it can, can translate to the next level is you know, the receivers have to be on his time. And it's so funny. Like I remember, even when when you know I was in Kansas City with Coach Reed, we would have a, a a an eight yard stop route. And I remember Coach Reed would tell our receivers, like, "Listen, if you're getting press, that eight yard stop route may turn into a six yard stop route because the West Coast mindset is everything is on time and in rhythm. Like that quarterback is taught, he's going to go five steps and the ball's out of his hands. Like he's not holding on to it. So like you need to be on his time. So if you don't get your eight yards because you're getting gentle line of scrimmage." You need to know internally, like, okay, it has to stop at six because ball's coming out. And as a quarterback, you kind of know, like, okay, he's getting jammed up. You know, I'm going to throw it to this spot instead of that spot. So it's all about timing. It's all about getting the ball out on time because how that affects all the other routes, how it affects the defense. And when I watch Quinn, he throws with some of the best anticipation um, that I've seen from a quarterback. He, he, and a couple of times that it, I've seen multiple times where it hit a receiver and tight end in the helmet because he was too slow to get his helmet around or his head around. So you know, he forces those guys to play at a certain level uh, speed wise. And, and I love it. And I think this year, you know, year three in the offense, you know, they went to the portal, they got some good receivers. Uh, I think he's due for a nice, nice, really nice season. And, and, you know, definitely a, a mid round, if not early first round draft pick come next season. So much of that old line back to year mm-hmm. three with Sark. I just, I, I find myself trying to like, not, not be too crazy optimistic, but man, it's uh, it seems like mm-hmm. his potential is through the roof. Uh, last one for you. I, I never ask you this stuff, and I don't know why I don't. But can we end with a story uh, for a court, like about a quarterback that you played with, Carson Wentz, Chase Daniel, Alex Smith, two guys that everyone loves, and Carson Wentz. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I loved all of them. Um, you love Carson Alex, Wentz, really? What's that? You love Carson Wentz? Oh, Carson was great. Carson was really nice. I mean, Carson was he was a rookie when I was with him in Philly. Uh, just a really nice kid, hardworking, um, humble. Uh, just, I think Philly got to him a little bit. I mean, Philly can get to a lot of people. Car- Carson was Carson was a little bit of an introvert. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, one of the nicest guys you'll ever be around, one of the best teammates you'll ever be around. But Carson didn't want the spotlight. I mean, I mean, that's just his personality. Like Carson was not the one. Like we'd have like a, a quarterback offensive line dinners, 
and Carson would hate it when we'd have dinner like inside like the city, you know, like, you know, Thursday, after, you know, Thursday night after practice, we're going to this restaurant, you know, downtown Philly. And he's like, do we have to really go downtown? Like he did not like the spotlight. He didn't like, you know, obviously he did it and he was gracious and he was always so nice to fans, but like, he just wanted to live his life of I'm going to play football and I'm going to go home and hunt fish. And like, he lived like 45 minutes away from the facility, like in, in middle of nowhere. I don't even know if it was Pennsylvania or Jersey, like in the country country. He's like, get me out of here. Like, get me out of the city. Uh, I would say like no hate towards any person or fans in general, but just like, he just liked to kind of, you know, be to himself, uh, you know, with him and his dogs. And, and I think at this time, his girlfriend. So, but such a great teammate. Um, Alex was, I loved Alex. Alex was such a great mentor. Alex would always, every day, after practice, we'd be in the quarterback room watching film, like post practice, and we'd be listening to music. And Alex would just grill me on like '80s and '90s rock every single day. And I'm like, Alex, like I wasn't even born when some of this stuff came out. But he's like, girl, like how do you not know this song? How do you not know this song? And you, know, you have an older brother. Shame on your older brother for not teaching you some of these songs. I'm like, all right, Alex, like I will go home and start listening to '80s and '90s rock more. So that when it comes on, I can give you the exact artist and name of the song. So uh, uh, always, always a good time with those two, but very different. He's not that much older. He's like, what, 37 now? Like, no. How old is Alex Smith? Alex Smith is. Alex Smith was drafted in the early 90s. No, 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 no. Or early no. early 2000s, I mean. Early 2000. No, he's drafted. He's drafted 05, oh, right? He's 39. 39. 39. He's not that much older yeah. than us. He's, he's, yeah, he's you're my brother. Yeah, we're the same year, so it's I, so weird. Like when I got drafted, you think of these guys as so much older because I was I watched Alex in high school and college. Yeah, I even think maybe even middle school I watched Alex. You remember Alex was twenty years old when he got drafted? I mean, he was young, God. young, young. So That's crazy. you know, I was I knew Al, I knew about Alex Smith and watched him for so long. Then you get in a locker with him, locker room with him. And you think like these, like this old veteran guy. And I like thinking about it now because I'm 33. He was only like 29 years old. And I thought like he was like this, this super wise man. And I was like, dude, I, I remember when I was 29 years old, like, no, but like, you know, you, you look up to him because you've seen him play so much NFL football before. Just call him dad accidentally one time. Yeah. Just let it slip. <laughs> happens to the best of us. Uh, Aaron, you're the best man. Uh, we'll do this again. We'll talk soon. Appreciate it. Jersey contest, uh, round one. We did our voting. Follow the SDS pod on Twitter, at the SDS pod. Uh, we did round one. Bobby Boucher, clear winner. Easy, easy winner. That's kind of the way that we'll do it. We'll just go every four, and then we'll have some sort of bracket-style thing at the end where the winners will get to be able to face off, and we'll do it that way. Um, so round one is, is, or at least the first part of round one, I should say, is in the books. It's my turn this week. If you're watching this on YouTube, which you definitely should be, you can see that I am wearing an Ernie Banks jersey. Yes, we have the old school Cubs logo. The only thing that frustrates me about this jersey, which it's it's like the, the pullover style. Um, I, I love it. The mm -hmm. back, you can kind of see in a little bit with the logo right here. But the back, trying to show you, trying to show you as much as possible. I definitely just pulled a muscle in my back doing kind that. Kind of hit me with the traps. Like, hey, let me just show you my <laughs> back really quick. I'm trying to keep my headphones on because I got the, the you know, the plugins. Um, but it, the numbers kind of in the the lettering kind of wrinkled up a little bit with probably not doing the right wash settings one time. Mm -hmm. And I hate it when when stuff is that sensitive, like every sweater that's ever existed. Um, but yeah, I basically uh, I got this jersey kind of on a whim the summer that I worked at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And so this jersey was purchased in the Baseball Hall of Fame gift shop. We had a discount, a pretty significant discount. I want to say it was like 25, 30% off or something like that for whatever we wanted to be able to get, which was incredibly cool and also incredibly daunting to be like, what do I want to settle on? Because I am still a broke post-college student that's making some money with this internship, but not making enough money to just go ham in this gift shop like I would like to at this point in my life. And uh, I picked this little number out and it's great because it was at a time when the Cubs sucked. And I was like, I'm tired of buying jerseys of guys that are just going to be out of here in two years. And I'm going to be really disappointed. And instead it's going to feel like this era that didn't live up to this, this or that. It's like, just, just buy the jersey of Mr. Cub. The guy's name, Mr. Cub. Just yeah. do that, Connor. And you know what? 
it it plays everywhere plays everywhere it doesn't look too ridiculous i can wear this in public which i kind of like you know like sometimes that's the pushback i'll have against like a basketball jersey or some some football jerseys where you're like can you get away with wearing that in public and just like a random social setting and Mm -hmm. this one i feel like is kind of you know a little bit subtle enough to where i can wear this and not look like i'm you know on my way to the game like i need to be repping or something like that yes i love that that's i mean a nine or a ten out of ten just like the the whole story behind it, the fact that, you know, you, you followed our, our critical Jersey rules here, which is that, you know, okay. I went to the magic Hawks game last night, saw a guy walking around in a Mo Bamba Jersey. All right. Don't be that guy. Don't buy the Mo Bamba Jersey, you know, get, get the legend. If you know that your team is not exactly what you want it to be yet, you know, like even the Jaden Daniels thing for me was a little bit of a pull. He ended up winning the Heisman, but that could have gone so South. It could have been, you know, 150 plus dollar purchase that was South. So I love the concept of past you going, well, who am I going to be rocking right now? You know, is it going to be, or, or, or in 20 years, like right now is in right now, right? Like, you know, Ernie Banks is timeless. I love that style of jersey. I'm right there with you. That's the, that is the um, Braves jersey that I have is like that mm. old V cut because the buttons has always been a little bit weird to me on baseball jerseys. It yeah. feels like business casual almost. So that's the way to go. I'm always like, how many buttons should I have open on this? I, we're going to get to some baseball jerseys. Don't, don't you worry. Some w- that have the full buttons. And I'm going to have that very debate before I come on. I'm going to be like, do I leave one button open? Do I do two? There's a lot of guys that have like four buttons open now, like at the big league level. And I'm just like, that that seems like an inconvenience. Maybe it looks better. I, I don't know. But the buttons just put my brain in a total pretzel. That is the nice thing about the pullover. So, yes, this will be added to the contest. Uh, the first part of this next foursome that we will do for round one that will – uh, already has sent one on to the next round with the Bobby Boucher jersey. Um, okay, mini announcement. Very, very mini announcement. Good news and bad news. The bad news is that I will not be talking about college basketball on this podcast. Um, we have tons of great college hoops coverage on Saturday Down South. I love college basketball. I'm, I'm an Indiana grad. All right. I, I love college basketball. It's what I grew up with even more than college football, but I don't feel that I do it justice. And while there could be a little bit of crossover here and there. You know, we talk about somebody for lad of the week or something like that. We reference it in the open. It's, it's not going to be something that we're going to be getting crazy in depth with. And we're breaking down or having guests on strictly devoted to college basketball. I know we've kind of towed the line a little bit with that in the past, in the past, but our, our plan is to stick to strictly college football. That's the good news. I, I try and keep it as clean as possible when we're talking, but I think the words of Ron Swanson, they, they ring true. He said, very famously, never half ass two things, whole ass one thing. That is what we're going to do here on the Saturday Down South podcast. Please do not treat my lack of commentary on college hoops or college baseball as negligence. Both are incredible. I enjoy them. Last Saturday night, I, I mentioned I was a single parent. Lauren had friends in town. Get Claire down about like 730, door dashed some Chipotle. Went to town in the biggest burrito bowl I've ever had. Watched every second of IU just getting destroyed by Caitlin Clark and that Iowa team. And it was great. And I was like, man, I haven't had time to watch hoops until now. And as great as it is, and as much as I'm probably going to contribute to our coverage on the written side as well, I, we're just going to try and keep it 100 with all things college football. That's what we're going to do here on the Saturday Down South podcast. Well, do people still say keep it 100? Is that out? We just did. Wait, there you go. Okay. We're good with that, right? We don't. We're not. We're not going to be yearning for in-depth college hoops talk. And again, it's not a slight of college hoops. It's not. Right. I just feel like we do college football best. Let's do more college football. Yeah, I mean, and you know, being an Indiana grad you know, disqualifies you from caring about football. I would just look at Greg Byrne. He thinks the opposite <laughs> of that. All right, if you were on that Indiana staff, buddy, you got a buddy. job right now. We're going to do a time capsule episode where we look back on like 2019, like where college football was. And then Mm -hmm. talk about where it is now. We're going to be like the most valuable assistants on that Indiana staff are going to be taking over in Alabama. We're going to be like, what? What are you talking about? Lane Kiffin's two biggest wins, Indiana and LSU. (laughs) Anyway, it's just all the our dreams. Anyway, but yeah, point being, you know, I'm right there with you. And I, I, you know, growing up in Baton Rouge, I remember Shaq. I remember all of that. But I, it would be disingenuous to be like, hey, come tune in. 
for the best college basketball content. We feel like we could give you that level of college football podcast. We've talked about the amount of research, the amount of stuff that we do. Just there, you know, even Adam Spencer is a guy that definitely follow him on Twitter, hear his opinions, hear his stuff. But I'm sure he'll be on during the season. It's not that we don't care. It's just that I don't want to be like, hey, we're the authority on something if we're not. And so I, I, I love that move. And again, we still love and care about the sport. But you know, I love and care about lots of things that I'm not qualified to host a podcast on. So maybe true. every white dude does not need multiple podcasts. Ever thought about that? <laughs> we could cap it off at one here. <laughs> I think I would have one on Burrito Bowls. That's the only other place that I feel like I could get into, especially after go. that experience over the weekend. God, that thing was huge. It was at least five pounds. It had to be. If you have not, leave us a five-star review. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch every episode of the Saturday Down South podcast, which is presented by Texas Beat. Follow us on the app formerly known as Twitter, at the SDS Pod, at Sat Down South, at CJ O'Gara, at Go So Hard. Thanks, guys. Talk soon.